Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Owl Sight by Mercedes Lackey and Larry Dixon. Narrated by Kevin T. Collins. One. Keisha! When Keisha didn't answer, the fluting voice calling her name in the distance grew noticeably impatient. Keisha! Keisha Alder ignored her sister Shandi's continued calls. She was in the middle of a job she had no intention of cutting short. The sharp smell of vinegar filled Keisha's workshop, but she was so inured to it that it hardly even stung her nose. Shandi could wait long enough for Keisha to finish decanting her bruise potion, straining out the bits of wormwood with a fine net of cheesecloth. Keisha wrinkled her nose a little as the smell of vinegar intensified. The books said to use wine for the potion, but she had found that vinegar worked just as well, and there was no mistaking it for something drinkable, unless your taste in wine was really wretched. A cloth steeped in this dark brown liquid and bandaged against a bruise eased the pain and made the bruise itself heal much faster than it would on its own. So despite the odor, the potion was much in demand. She needed so much of it that she always had several jugs or bottles of the finished potion in storage, and more jars of it in various states of preparation. It had to steep for six weeks at a minimum, so she tried to empty one jar and start another once a week. Keisha held her hands steady. She didn't want to waste any of it in spillage. She even wrung the cheesecloth dry, then reached for a stopper whittled from a birch branch and her pot of warm paraffin. As soon as the last drop was sealed into its special dark brown pottery jug, and the jug itself placed safely on a high shelf, she knocked the soggy fragments of herb out of the wide-mouthed jar, added two handfuls of freshly crumbled dry wormwood, and poured in vinegar to the top. Footsteps behind her warned her that Shandi had come to the workshop looking for her, so she wasted no time in tying a square of waxed linen over the top of the jar and setting it at the end of the row of nine more identical jars. She turned to face the door, just as Shandi stepped across the threshold into the cool gloom of the workshop, blinking eyes still dazzled by the bright sun outside. Although not dressed in her festival best, Shandi was, as always, so neat and spotless that Keisha became uncomfortably aware of the state of her own stained brown breeches and far from immaculate, too large tunic. Shandi wore a white apron embroidered with dark blue thread, a neat brown skirt, and a pristine white blouse with the blue embroidery matching the apron, all the work of her own hands. Keisha's tunic and breeches were hand-me-downs from her brothers, plain as a board, indifferently shortened, and both had seen their best days many years ago. But what else am I supposed to wear for working with messy potions, dosing sick babies, and sewing up bloody gashes? She asked herself crossly, annoyed at herself for feeling embarrassed. This isn't some tale where everyone wears cloth of gold and tunics with silk embroidery. Shandi would look pretty sad after a half day of my work. Keisha, are we going to the market or not? Shandi asked impatiently, then screwed up her face in a grimace as a whiff of vinegar reached her. We're going, though I don't know why you want to go so badly, Keisha replied, hoping she didn't sound as irritated as she felt. Die, Shandi replied promptly. No, thank you. I have too much to do right now, Keisha said impishly, grinning as Shandi first looked puzzled, then mimed a blow at her for the pun. 
You know what I mean, Shandi giggled. You never know what the hunters are going to bring in, and I'm still looking for a decent red, one that won't fade the first time someone looks too long at it. She smiled. You know I need to have you along. After all, you know so much more about these things than I do, and you're better at bargaining. I'd be sure to get cheated, and then you'd be annoyed because you weren't with me to save me from a sharp traitor. Keisha's irritation had vanished, as it always did around Shandi. No one could stay irritated with her sister for long. Shandi's nature was as sweet as her innocent face, and she played peacemaker to the entire village of Erald's Grove. Keisha and Shandi were almost the same height, with the same willowy figures, same golden brown hair and eyes, and almost the same features. But in all other ways, they were as different as if they had come from opposite sides of the world. Sometimes I think when the gods gave out tempers, they gave me all of the thorns and her all the rose petals. You're right, of course. I would be annoyed. She rinsed her hands in lemon balm water to remove the vinegar smell, and any lingering trace of wormwood, poison if ingested, and dried them on a clean rag. And I should have remembered about the red. How many of the girls have you promised embroidery thread to? Only three: Heidi, Jenna, and Sari. I wouldn't trust the rest with red. They'd be sure to do something tasteless with it. Shandi's bright brown eyes glowed with suppressed laughter. Ugh! Can't you imagine it? Roses the size of cabbages all around the hems of their skirts. Or worse, Keisha said dryly, roses the size of cabbages over each breast. Lalas is not exactly subtle, and she's always looking for a way to bring attention to her assets. Not that anyone needs help in seeing them. You could hide half the village in that cleavage, and a quarter of the village would be oh so happy to stay there. I'm all done for now. Let's go before someone decides they have a bellyache and comes looking for a posset. Side by side, Keisha and her sister strolled down a neat, stone-edged path between the houses, heading toward the village square. Once a week, the village of Erald's Grove held a market day, and those from outside the village and no particular interest in seeking further and possibly more lucrative venues took full advantage of it. For some people, it simply wasn't worth the effort to travel long distances just to make more money from their goods. They'd rather that other folk did the traveling and took the extra profit. As had been the case in the past, there were plenty of traders willing to do just that. So the weekly market was usually visited by at least one far traveler from spring to early winter. And three of the quarterly fairs—spring equinox, midsummer, and harvest—brought traders in their dozens. Erald's Grove was more prosperous now than it had been in its earlier heyday, with dozens of trappers and dye hunters working the forest and hills. None of them was actually from. Erald's Grove. The villagers were still far too wary of the forest to be tempted by the possibility of profit hidden in its depths. But the Hawk Brothers were here now, and to some people, their presence meant increased safety, or at least a smaller likelihood of being eaten by misshapen monsters. So the dye hunters and all the people who supported and profited by them were back, as well as a new class of folk who actually specialized in trapping the strange new creatures created by the change circles. The population of Erald's Grove had swelled to half again more than the village had ever held before. They even had their own temple and priest, so now the children of the village got proper lessons in the winter instead of being homeschooled or taught by one of the old women. For most of the children, that was a mixed blessing, as the priest took his duty seriously and wasn't as easily distracted as a mother or as prone to doze off as an old granny. 
They still didn't have a fully trained official healer, though, and Keisha served in place of one, wearing her ordinary clothing rather than even the pale green robes of a trainee. Healers were in short supply still, and so far there hadn't been a real need to have one posted to Erald's Grove. Lord Breon had a healer, and according to Healer's Collegium, he could take care of anything here that Keisha couldn't. Though never selected for her gift by a fully trained healer in the approved and official manner, Keisha had begun showing her talents at the age of five, by taking care of the ills of the stock on the farm, then moving on to patching up the childhood hurts and illnesses of her brothers and sisters. It got to the point where they came to her instead of their mother, since Keisha's remedies were far more likely to set things right and taste better than their mother's book of recipes from her granny. Things might never have gone any further, but fear of the change beasts and longing for other human company together drove Keisha's parents to resettle in the village. That had happened a few months after the barbarian invasion, when one family decided they'd had enough of Erald's Grove and a house fortuitously fell vacant. Not long after that, once she widened her circle of patching up to the rest of the children and their pets, the villagers discovered Keisha's talent, and a concerted effort began to turn their new citizen into a fully educated, fully stocked, fully prepared healer. As she and her sister passed the home that had drawn them here, now silent, with the rest of the family out working the fields and tending the stock, Keisha grinned a little. Maybe if her parents had known what was going to happen, they wouldn't have been so quick to leave the farmstead. Her mother and father hadn't stood a chance against the will of the village, and they'd lost Keisha's labor at the farm before they knew what had happened. They might have tried to fight to keep Keisha and her two sturdy hands theirs alone, but the arrival of a herald on circuit put an end to any thoughts of making the attempt. The golden moment was a cherished memory, the point when Keisha became something other than ordinary in her parents' eyes. The herald, oh, he was fine to look at, all white and tall on his silver companion. He took one look at me that went right down to my bones and declared in a voice like a trumpet, This girl has the healer's gift. Much to Keisha's bemusement, before he left for the rest of his circuit, he had arranged for Lord Breon's healer, Gil Gerard, to give Keisha instruction. Several weeks later, a trader delivered into her hands copies of every book used by the trainees at Healer's Collegium, courtesy of that august body, and a polite note reminding everyone that the books were worth not a small fortune, but a rather large one, enough to buy half the town, and theft or harm to the books counted as a crime against the crown." With the books had come three sets of the pale green robes of a healer trainee, lest anyone doubt her acceptance. Keisha still preferred not to wear them, though. It seemed a pity to get them as stained and dirty as they would be if she donned them for her regular work. No more weeding and mowing for her. The letter that came with this library told her that she was expected to study those books any time that she was intending the ailments of man or beast, or brewing medicines for same. She already had the skills needed to make most medications, and had lacked only the knowledge of what herbs were needed— the books supplied that, with good pictures to guide her when she went hunting for them in the forest and fields, and detailed instructions for each preparation. Along with the books came a box of seeds for those herbs that did well under cultivation, all carefully labeled with planting and growing instructions. 
It was obvious that she was expected to become self-sufficient and quickly. For a while, Keisha had used the kitchen of the family home for her workroom, and her mother had seen that as a possible way to discourage this new career. Mother should never have complained about my green messes in her kitchen, telling everyone she was afraid I was going to poison the family, Keisha thought, with just a touch of self-satisfaction. I know she thought that the council would agree that I should stop, but it had the opposite effect. In fact, the council didn't wait for her to complain directly to them. The moment the village council got wind of the complaints, they assigned Keisha her own workshop, a sturdy little stone building that had once been the home of the village savior and hero, Wizard Justin. They even went so far as to make a special day of preparing it for her, organizing a village-wide clean-up and repair of the place, presenting her with a cottage scoured, inside and out, roof newly thatched, all the bits and pieces still littering the interior taken out and broken into kindling. She had only to say where she wanted workbenches and shelves, and they appeared, had only to ask for a place to lie down, and a fine feather bed and a pile of pillows and quilts showed up in the sleeping loft. The people of Erald's Grove had learned their lesson about treating a healer right, having had to do without a healer of any kind for so long after Wizard Justin died. Heady stuff for a fourteen-year-old youngster, she thought wryly, from her distant vantage of eighteen. I'm surprised my head didn't get too big to fit a hat. She waved at the blacksmith's oldest apprentice as they passed the forge. He waved absently back, but his eyes, as all the eyes of any male over the age of thirteen, were on Shandy. I suppose the only reason it didn't was that I was too busy to get a swelled head. She had been busy every waking moment, in fact. When she wasn't studying her books, she was out in the forest gathering medicinal plants, on her knees in her new garden cultivating herbs, or making preparations for healer Gill to examine. At last, when Gill was satisfied that her skill at producing medicines was the equal of his, he stopped inspecting her results before allowing her to use them, and started teaching her how to use the knife and the needle, how to set bones and restore dislocated joints as he did. Unfortunately, the one thing he can't teach me is how to use my gift, and the books are not very useful there either. Healer Gill's gift was not very strong, and he relied on his skill with the knife and his truly amazing knowledge of herbalism for most of his cures. Keisha would have been perfectly happy to do the same, but Healer Gill kept insisting that she make use of this gift that she didn't understand. Gradually, though, what with all Gill had to do, his visits had shortened and the intervals between them lengthened, until now he came to Erald's Grove no more than once every moon and never stayed longer than half a day. He even trusted her now to experiment with new preparations, something that made her so proud she practically glowed every time she thought about it. That was why Shandi wanted her to come along on this hunt for the elusive true red dye. Her knowledge of herbs and other plants extended into dyes, and she had a knack for telling which ones would fade, which would need too much mordant to be practical, and which would turn some other less desirable color with age. Some dyes could even be used as medicine, so Keisha never lost a chance to explore their possibilities. In a village where every person had some specialty, however small, Shandi was the one who supplied everyone else with common embroidery thread the equal of anything a trader could bring in. Her threads, whether spun from wool, linen, or rame, were strong, hair-fine, and even. 
Her colors were true and fast. So even as the villagers gladly paid Keisha for tending their ills, knowing that she had to pay for the medicines and supplies she couldn't make, grow, or find for herself, they even more gladly told over their copper coins for a hank of Shandi's thread. The village square was the site of the weekly market, with the square closed to all but foot traffic and stalls set up along all four sides— Besides the usual things found in a village market, produce and foodstuffs, Erald's Grove had specialties of its own to boast of. Along with the dye hunters had come dye traders and dye buyers, who purchased bundles of plants and fungus and things that defied description, then leached or cooked out the pigments and pressed them into little cakes for sale. The buyers seldom left Erald's Grove, preferring to act as middlemen and sell their dye cakes to traders, but they were by no means reluctant to sell a cake or two to their neighbors. The tanner also put some of his unusual furs on offer at this weekly market, giving villagers first choice of what the hunters brought him. In addition, now Erald's Grove had its own potter, who was an artist in his own right, using some of the new and strange pigments and foreign earths from the change circles and a variety of modeling and carving techniques to make ordinary clay pots into things almost too beautiful for use. There was, alas, no glass blower as yet, though there were rumors that one might be coming soon. Most glass came from the Hawk Brothers or from traders. The miller's son had begun experimenting with paper-making a year ago, and now his efforts were on sale roughly every other market day, alongside inks Keisha had taught him to make from oak galls and soot, small brushes he made from badger hair, and pens he cut himself from goose quills. So now it was possible for lovers to exchange silent vows, for thrifty wives to keep account books, for those with artistic pretensions to inflict their work on their relatives, and for everyone to write to relatives far and near. That last item alone, that tiny token of civilization, made Erald's Grove seem less like the end of the universe and more like a part of Valdemar when it was possible to communicate, however infrequently, with those outside the confines of Lord Breon's holdings, people didn't feel forgotten any more. Then there was the fellowship. Keisha nodded a friendly greeting toward the fellowship booth, and the soberly clad woman tending it smiled and nodded back, her smile widening as Shandi's footsteps suddenly and predictably lagged, and her eyes went to the delicate wisps of fabric draped temptingly over a line at the back of the booth. The fellowship, a loose amalgamation of a dozen families related only in their religious beliefs and a firm commitment to peace and a life with no violence or anger in it, had arrived in Erald's Grove two years ago with their herds, their household goods, and their readiness to work and work hard. Within months, they had built an enclave of a dozen stout houses and barns enough for all their animals. Within a year, traders were coming especially to buy what they produced. For what the fellowship specialized in was producing remarkable textiles, lengths of tapestry-woven fabric, intricate braids and other trims, and a very few simple garments such as shawls and capes, woven, knitted, knotted, and braided of the beautifully spun and dyed wool from their herds. The creatures providing the wool were no ordinary animals. The fellowship had goats with coats so long and silky that it was a pleasure to touch them, sheep with wool the texture of the finest thistledown, and a special variety of chira. 
They were a little smaller and had a sweeter, more delicate face than those used as winter pack animals, and they possessed a coat of wool that, when woven, was softer than the finest suede deerskin, light, dense, and so warm that one had to wear a cloak of it to believe it. These animals all needed more tending than their mundane counterparts, so much so that it was likely that few folk would be willing to put that much work into their care. Nevertheless, it was obviously worth it to the folk of the fellowship, since traders came from as far away as Haven itself to purchase items such as their chira cloaks and blankets, their intricately patterned fabrics, and their wedding shawls, wraps of knitted lace so fine and delicate that they could be drawn through a wedding ring. Kisha had heard that it had become the fashion for the high-born of Valdemar to present one of these shawls to daughters of their houses to mark a betrothal, or for a suitor to offer one in token that he intended to ask for a woman's hand. Well. What was desirable for the high-born of Valdemar was also the heart's desire of every girl of marriageable age in Erold's Grove, and the folk of the fellowship were pleased to make it possible for these less than high-born suitors and parents to grant those yearnings with special prices for the folk of their home village. Small wonder Shandi's eyes and feet were drawn to the booth. She had three current suitors, all hotly pursuing her and completely unsuitable in their father's estimation. Any one of whom could give her the reason for selecting such a shawl and pointing her choice decorously out to him. Shandi, Keisha called her wandering attention back with a touch of exasperation. Look, let's see if there's a red dye first. Then you can go look at shawls while I see if anyone's brought medicines or herbs that I can use. All right, Shandi agreed, though with an audible sigh. Satisfied that she had her sister's attention for at least a little while, Keisha and Shandi made the rounds of all three dye seller's booths, looking for that so elusive red. Keisha deliberately went to Barlin's booth last. He was, in her opinion, the most honest of the three. As they neared his booth, he twinkled at Shandi and crooked a finger at her. They hurried to his counter. I think I may have something for you, young ladies," the cheerful, weather-tanned man said. "I've only been waiting for our good healer's expert opinion on it." He nodded at Keisha, who flushed. He cleared bundles of dried fungus off the counter and reached beneath it, bringing out a cake the size of his hand and as black as dried blood, together with something that looked like a seed pod made of dried leather. He placed hands with nails from beneath, which no amount of soap and water would ever remove the traces of dye on the counter. Here's the dye, and here's the thing it comes from. Now you tell me if this is going to be as good as I think it is. Keisha crumbled a bit off the cake, smelled it, very cautiously tasted it, and tried dissolving it in a cup of water he provided. It didn't dissolve, and she raised an eyebrow at the dye merchant, who only grinned. Won't dissolve in water, nor in water and soap," he said in triumph. Here, he tossed out the water and poured a bit of clear liquid into the cup from a stoppered bottle. It appeared to be thrice distilled spirits by the potent smell, and very nearly made her drunk just to sniff it. She dropped a crumb of dye in and was rewarded by a spreading crimson stain. Let me add a bit of salt for mordant, and you see for yourself what this stuff does. He brought out another cup and poured water into that, then obliged her with some scraps and threads to try in the dye. The samples they dunked in the dye became gratifying shades of scarlet, and no amount of rinsing in the water he'd provided would take the color out. 
As Shandi sucked in her breath with excitement, Keisha brought the threads up to her nose until she was nearly cross-eyed, examining every crevice and crack to see if the dye was taking evenly. Finally, she pronounced judgment. I think it will fade eventually, but it will take years as long as you keep the color out of the sun, she told both the merchant and her sister. Dying with distilled spirits will be tricky, maybe dangerous, what with the fumes being flammable. Worse for someone doing large batches of thread and yarn than for you, Shandi, but this is probably the best red I've ever seen. She turned her attention to the pod and picked it up to peer at it. Just what is this thing? A snail, the merchant said gleefully and no one would ever have noticed what secret this little creature held if Turthorn hadn't tried to cook them in white wine. I'm the only one he told, and I got him to promise me an exclusive market. Shandi had to laugh at that. So Turthorn's famous palate and cooking experiments finally have some use. I suppose we should just be glad he didn't try to cook them in red wine. The dye merchant laughed. Oh, now, he'd never have done that. Haven't we heard him say a thousand times that no one with any real taste would cook snails in red wine? Keisha's thoughts were more practical. So exactly how much are you going to part us from for this wonder? She asked dubiously. She knew it wasn't going to be cheap, not as strong a red as this, nor one as color-fast. She also knew Shandi would take it at any price, and was just fervently glad that it was this merchant who had the supply, not one of the other two. For you, Shandi, I'll trade it weight for weight in silver. Keisha tried not to wince, but the price was fair. If he had any sense, when he got the stuff into civilized lands, he'd trade it weight for weight in gold. Shandi grimaced, but didn't argue when Keisha didn't. Fair enough, she said bravely, and dug out four silver coins, placing them on one side of his scales. He crumbled dye into the pan on the other side until they leveled off equal, then winked again and crumbled a bit more into the pan. He pocketed the coins, then tilted the pan of dye into a paper cone, tapping it to get every crumb into the container. With a little bow, he handed the precious packet to Shandi, who twisted the open end of the cone tight and put it carefully into her pouch. "'I'll tell you something else, young ladies,' he said, as they were about to move on. I haven't looked any further than to get the scarlet. If you can tell me how to get a deep, fast purple as good as the red out of that, I'll have the price if you give me an exclusive from here on. Keisha's eyebrows both went up. Really, was all she replied, but her mind was already on changing the mordant, adding other possible ingredients, experimenting with double dyeing with indigo. Barlin's look told her that he'd all but seen her thoughts written on her forehead. If anyone can do it, he continued with a wave, you two can. Oh, and Keisha, you ought to go talk to Steelmind. He came to market by himself, and I think he's got some seeds you might be interested in. Really, she exclaimed, as Shandi headed straight for the fellowship booth, one hand protectively cupped over her pouch. Thanks, Barlin. No problem. Another villager approached the booth, and Barlin turned his attention to the potential new customer. Keisha moved along to the shaded arbor next to the new temple that the Hawk brothers used as a booth when they came to Erald's Grove. Normally, Hawk Brothers only appeared for the quarterly fair market days, and when they came, they came in force, with a half-dozen bead and feather bedecked traders and their fierce-looking birds of prey. They took over the arbor and put up a pavilion as well, and traders buzzed around them like bees at a honey pot for the things they brought, though, aside from a few items, never predictable, 
were always fantastic. Sometimes it was lengths of silk fabric in impossible colors and patterns. Sometimes it was trims and ribbons made of the same silks and silk embroidery thread that girls saved for their wedding dresses. They had been known to bring jewelry, glassware, odd spices and incense, vials of scent and massage oils, rugs sometimes, and once simpler variations on their own tunics and robes. Those items that were predictable were always welcome. Ropes and cording much stronger than anyone else could make, and much lighter too. Hammocks made from that same cord, amazing feathers, furs unlike anyone else brought, leather tanned so that it was as supple and soft as their silks, rare woods, and carvings in stone, ivory, and wood. But sometimes one called Steel Mind came by himself, bringing strange ornamental or useful plants, herbs, and seeds. Keisha liked him for all that he never said one word more than he absolutely had to. She also liked his bird, a slow and sleepy buzzard who was perfectly happy to accept a head scratch from her. Sure enough, Steel Mind had tucked himself and his bird into the depths of the arbor, with bare root plants, roots carefully wrapped in damp moss, and an assortment of well-grown seedlings in small plugs of earth arranged beside him. His blue eyes brightened when he saw Keisha, and he waved a welcome and an invitation to sit, all in the same gesture. Barlin says you have some seeds," she said, giving the bird his scratch before settling on the turf beneath the arbor. Her tunic puddling around her, she bent over to look at the plants he'd brought and recognized the bare root ones to be young rose vines, roses. She tried to imagine what Hawk Brother bred rose vines would be like and failed. She resolved to take at least one of them home with her, maybe more. Mum would love a climbing rose going over a trellis at the front door, and it would be nice to have one plant in the herb garden that isn't useful for anything. She felt the same avariciousness that Shandi must have felt over the dye. If there was one weakness she had, it was for her garden. It is spring. So mostly, I have flower seeds and seedlings, and these. He gestured at the rose vines, but she sensed he was teasing her. Mostly, she replied. Our healer suggested a few others before I left. Steel Mind said and smiled, an expression that transformed his face and made it obvious that he wasn't much older than she was. He laughed a little. Actually. It was stronger than merely suggestion. He rummaged in a basket at his side and brought out fat little packets of tough silk sewn at the top to resemble tiny sacks of grain. Each one had a symbol painted on it in a different color. This stops pain. This stops cough. This is a balm. This stops itching from insect bites and rashes. There are instructions in each packet on growing and use. They work better than what I use now, she asked skeptically. He shrugged, and the beads woven into his hair clicked together. Different. That's all I know. Better. I don't know. I'm not a healer, and we do not know what you have to work with. No worse, certainly. And I have been given orders that if you want them, your price is nothing. Healer to healer is what I was told. Nothing? They do trust me to know what I'm doing, and that these herbs were different from those she had been using. She knew from her own experience that a medication that one person responded well to might not work on another, and might make a third sicker. That was the peril of working with herbs. I'll take them and thank your healer very sincerely for me," she replied. "And how much for the rose vines? It will be nice to have something in my garden that isn't for healing people." 
and who is to say that a rose cannot heal? He smiled and named his prices. They haggled amiably and settled on a price that didn't leave either of them feeling cheated. She gathered up her spoils, two rose vines, which would make everyone happy, and gave the bird a second scratch, which he seemed to expect. Then she left the arbor to go find Shandi and tear her away from the fellowship booth. Or try, anyway. If she got to talking embroidery and die with the attendant, nothing less than a miracle would take her away before the sun went down. Keisha squinted against the bright sunlight and peered up the street as a flock of crows flew overhead, yelling cheerful insults at the village below. As she had half expected, Shandi and the fellowship woman were deep in conversation. Keisha shrugged her shoulders and sighed, wondering if it was going to be worth the trouble to try to pry Shandi away. If so, she had the choice of looking very rude and bossy and actually getting the job done quickly or spending far more time than she wanted to and looking polite and courteous. If there had only been Shandi to consider, there would just be a few sharp words and it would be done with. But she really didn't want to look boorish in front of a member of the fellowship. It was a short, internal debate. There's no point. If she finished her chores, I've got no call to tell her how to spend her free time, and if she hasn't, she can take the consequences herself. Shandi's one fault was that she tended to forget things she had to do when she disliked them. When they were younger, it had been Keisha's task to supervise her and see to it that the forgotten chores were done, because if Shandi didn't do them, Keisha would have to pitch in later. Mum's idea of a proper form of incentive for me to be an ogre, but I don't have time to spare to pitch in now. I'm not her keeper, no matter what Mum thinks, and Shandi's sixteen and old enough to take the consequences by herself. She ambled slowly up the street, enjoying the novel sensation of having people around her who were not in discomfort or pain, who were, in fact, entirely contented. Lately, it had become uncomfortable for her to be near people in any sort of distress, as if she shared their feelings. She'd fancied once or twice that it was the sort of empathy power that she heard told of in stories, but dismissed the thought quickly. Things like that didn't happen to ordinary people from little towns like Erold's Grove, and her gift was an extraordinary enough fluke. It wouldn't be too long until spring equinox fair, and the booths of those who sold their goods to the far-ranging traders were stuffed full, while the booths of those who depended on those same traders to bring them goods from outside were getting mighty empty. The dye sellers, the folk who bought up a great deal of the Hawk Brother trade goods, and the fellowship would all send most of their stock with the traders when the fair was over. The blacksmith needs metals, the baker needs spices and sugar, the girls are craving glass beads, laces and ribbons. I need things I can't get here." Healer Gil Gerard would be just as happy if she didn't have to rely on those medicines, though. That was one subject on which they didn't and probably would never agree. He couldn't tell her how to use her gift. More importantly, he had no way to oversee her and tell her what she was doing right or wrong, the way he could with medicines and the knife. How was she supposed to use this so-called gift effectively or even safely? I suppose it would be quite useful if I could make head or tail out of those texts, she thought glumly, as she neared the fellowship booth and Shandi. It's almost as if they were written in a code that is perfectly understandable to everyone but me, and I am feeling far too sorry for myself. 
Determined not to spoil what was a perfectly fine spring day, Keisha decided to stop thinking and simply enjoy. A light breeze brought a hint of incense from the temple, which joined harmoniously with the fresh flowers some of the stall keepers used as decoration. The sunshine warmed her with the promise of a fine spring to come. The annual village-wide spring cleaning had taken place only a few days earlier in preparation for the spring fair, and as a consequence, the entire village was as charming as a high-born child's toy. Streets had been swept of all the winter accumulation of junk and debris. Houses and fences were newly whitewashed. Market booths all neatly mended. What a perfect scene this would be for a painter or a tapestry maker to reproduce! She thought, just as she came even with Shandi. This is how the highborn think all our villages look all the time. Still, she shouldn't be so cynical. It really is pretty. The red shutters, the pale gold of the thatched roofs, the rainbow colors of the flowers everywhere, the handsome white horse posing right at the end of the street. White horse? There were no white horses in Erald's Grove. Keisha shook her head and looked again, but the vision didn't go away. Instead, it drew nearer. There was a blue-eyed white. Horse decked out in blue and silver riding gear at the end of the street nearest the bridge, and he was coming straight toward the market square. There was purpose in each and every step he took. He had no rider, and was he looking at her? You had to have lived in a cave all your life not to know what a blue-eyed white horse was and meant in this kingdom. This was a companion, and alone like this, with no urgency in his demeanor, he hadn't lost his herald, nor was his herald in trouble. No, he had to be on search, and that meant he was looking for a new. Harold, well, Harold Trainee, the person to whom he would be bonded for the rest of both their lives. It seemed that the entire market saw the companion at the same time that Keisha did. Everyone stopped talking, and the silence that fell over the square was broken only by the soft chiming of bridle bells and the matching overtones of the companion's deliberate steps. He knew very well that all eyes were on him too. He arched his neck and lifted each hoof so high he might have been on parade. Keisha froze. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw that Shandi had done the same. The companion was looking neither to the right nor to the left, and there were only two people of reasonable age for him to choose from in the direction he was moving. Of course, companions had been known to choose full adults in the past, but it was unusual. No, the only two people likely to be chosen in this village who were present at the moment were Shandi and Keisha. For a moment, Keisha was stunned, too shocked to think this was not supposed to be happening. But as the companion moved closer, she wrenched herself out of her shock with a grimace as dismay washed over her. Don't you dare! She thought with annoyance, bordering on anger at the companion. Don't you dare try to choose me! Her hands balled into fists as she stared into his eyes, willing him to hear her. Don't even think about choosing me. I have responsibilities here, you dolt. People here need me for what I can do, and I can't just ride out of here and leave them. Listen to me, you fool. Don't. Maybe staring into his eyes had been a mistake. She felt the rest of the world vanishing around her as she fell into those twin pools of sapphire. But before she could drown in them, she bit her lip to bring her back to herself and hurled her denial at him. I am not expendable, she thought, working up real heat at the thought that anyone, even a companion, could march into her life and proceed to reorder it for her. I am not going.
she sensed surprise. Pick somebody else. Now she sensed amusement. Why amusement? Her anger evaporated. The eyes turned away from her, let her go. Had they ever really held her, or had that only been her imagination? She didn't get a chance to think about it because movement beside her caught her attention. The companion stood quietly, and now it was Shandi who walked with slow, entranced steps toward him. She looked like a sleepwalker, and Keisha stifled the impulse to grab her arm and keep her where she was. Still, I'm not her keeper. If this is what she wants, she should try to make it work. She's old enough to make up her own mind, just as I am, and live with whatever comes of it. Although it looked as if consequences were the last thing on Shandi's mind right now, Shandi stopped just a step away from the companion's nose and slowly reached her hand forward as if she feared to touch him. Keisha waited, heart pounding, biting her lower lip. The companion made short work of Shandi's hesitation, craning his neck forward as his bridle bells chimed and putting his nose in her hand. Then they just stood there for a long, long time, and Keisha's breathing seemed very loud in the silence. Then, as Keisha's nerves wound tighter and tighter, like an overtuned harp string, the spell, or whatever it was, finally broke. They both moved, the companion tossing his head and sidling around so that his stirrup and saddle were in easy reach. Shandi reached for the cantle, then turned to her sister with eyes brimming with wonder. That snapped everyone else out of their tense silence, and before Shandi could speak, she was surrounded by friends and neighbors, all of them contributing to a conglomerate of babble that sounded like a shouting match between a flock of hens and a gaggle of geese. As far as Keisha could make out, none of them had anything very intelligent to say, but they were all very intent on saying it. Through a gap in the crowd, Shandi peered entreatingly back at her sister. Keisha sighed and pushed her way past everyone else to reach her. Shandi paid attention to no one else, holding out her free hand entreatingly. Keisha, I didn't mean. I mean, I want to go, but I didn't ask. I mean, I didn't intend. Shandi was doing a good job of babbling herself, and Keisha reached out and gave her shoulders a friendly shake. Of course, you didn't mean for this to happen, you ninny. She half scolded, half cajoled. Choosings aren't planned. Everyone knows that. And it's not as if you'd gone and made an appointment for this hairy beast to show up. I mean, if you could simply decide to be a herald, what would be the point? Herald would be like any other job. You get chosen because you're the right person to be a herald. You know that, and I most certainly am not. Was it her imagination, or did the companion swing his head around and wink at her, just as she thought that? Oh, there's probably a fly buzzing around his ears. But Keisha. I have to go. I mean, I have to go now. And Shandi looked at her, pleading with her to understand. Tears brimming in her eyes and rolling slowly down one cheek. And if you didn't have to go now, you know that Mum would find a thousand reasons why you couldn't go ever. I know that. Havens, probably everybody in town knows that. Keisha tried to smile. But it was a great deal more difficult than she had thought it would be. Shandi, that's why it happens this way. I'll bet that otherwise every single mother in Valdemar would have a thousand reasons why her child couldn't go herring off into the sunset just on the say so of a big white horse. But, but, Shandi's expression was painfully easy to read. Fix things for me. Her eyes pleaded. This is more important than anything in my life. But I can't go if you don't promise to fix things for me. Keisha closed her eyes for the briefest of moments, no more than a blink. 
stifled a sigh, and nodded. Just like always, it looked as if she was going to have to pitch in after all and help clean up the mess. But that's not being generous, and if it was me, oh, if Shandi could have substituted for me, I'd be at Healer's Collegium now. Go, she urged her sister, and meant it. Go and go now. I'll take care of everything. Shandi believed her. Shandi always believed her. With a sigh of relief and a sudden smile like the sun emerging from a thundercloud, she kissed Keisha, hugged her tight, then fumbled loose the strings holding her belt pouch to her belt. Here, she said, pressing it into Keisha's hands. Take the dye. See what you can do with it. Maybe it'll be good for a medicine. Then she turned away and mounted the companion saddle with such ease and grace that it looked as if she'd been doing it all her life, never mind that she'd never ridden anything before but their aged pony. The companion clearly was taking no chances. He gave Shandi no further chances for farewells or regrets. He danced a little, shook his harness, and pivoted in place on his hind feet. That got people to move out of his way, and pretty briskly, too. He moved out at a fast walk, allowing Shandi time enough only to wave goodbye before breaking into a canter at the end of the street. In no time at all, they were over the bridge, then lost to sight as the road was hidden by trees. Keisha let out the sigh she'd been holding in, and the exasperation. While the rest of the villagers gathered in knots, still babbling with excitement, Keisha felt the weight of yet another burden fall on her shoulders. Let's see. One hysterical mother, three heartbroken suitors, half a dozen friends left forlorn and a little jealous. I can handle that. I hope... Keisha stood with her back to the wall in the warm, soup-scented kitchen and wished she were anywhere else but there. Sidoni Alder had reacted to the news that her youngest daughter had been chosen as a herald precisely as she would have if Shandi had been abducted by barbarians. This made no sense, of course, but Keisha hadn't expected anything else. She tried not to wince when Sidoni's voice rose to new and shriller heights. I can't believe you just let her go like that. How could you just stand there and let her be carried off? This was only about the hundredth time Keisha's mother had repeated that particular accusation, and it didn't look as if she were going to stop thinking Keisha was the villainous of the situation any time soon. Each time Sidoni uttered another outburst, before Keisha had a chance to say anything sensible in reply, she broke down into hysterical sobs and cast herself into the arms of her husband or one of her two oldest sons. This time it was her husband's arms where she sought shelter from her traitorous offspring. He patted her back and said consolingly, now, mother, you know that's how it is. Keisha couldn't have done not. That's how they always do these choosing things, I suppose, so they can make a clean break and all. But she's only a baby. She can't take care of herself all alone, was the inevitable reply, followed by a fresh spate of tears. Keisha wisely kept silent this time, since anything she'd tried to say until now had only brought on another outburst. Her brother Gary was injudicious enough to put in his two bits. Ah, Mom, she's not so little as all that, Gary protested. She's old enough to take care of herself, and anyway, you know them companions see to it the kids they choose are right and tight. You'd have been losing her pretty soon anyway. She's had three bows, and like as not, she'd have been married in a year or two. Oh, no. Now he's given Mum something else to weep about, Keisha thought with dismay. She was right. Now I'll never see her wed, came the wail, muffled by her husband's shoulder. 
Keisha swallowed as her stomach roiled. This was beginning to make her sick, literally. But her father had a thoughtful look on his face, and it was pretty clear that he was thinking there was another side to all this, one that had a lot of advantages besides the obvious. Female heralds, if they wed, generally married other heralds. On the rare occasions they married outside the circle, it was with men who asked nothing more of them than their company outside of duty, usually healers or bards. So if Shandi married, there would be no dowry to raise. If she wed, it would be with someone who would live far from Erald's Grove, so there would be no need to put up with a son-in-law he disliked, and he disliked all three of Shandi's suitors, each for a different reason. The obvious reasons for being pleased about the situation were many, and he'd already brought them up to his wife, as had Keisha. Their daughter was going to be a herald. They'd be the parents of a herald. People would look up to them. They'd have new importance in the village. People would listen to what they said, even ask their opinions on matters of importance. Oh, of course she was going to be doing work that was often dangerous, but not for years yet, and it still wasn't all that safe here in Erald's Grove. After all, what if the barbarians came back? Keisha could tell that her father had clearly come to the opinion that this was no bad thing. His thoughts might just as well have been written on his face for Keisha to read. Mum, she's going to be fine, Keisha said, once again, as her mother's sobs quieted. When have you ever heard of a newly chosen trainee coming to grief on the road? She's going to be a very important person now, and people will look up to you because she's your daughter. We might even get invited to court some day and see the queen. And if she decides to get married, whatever gave you the idea that she wouldn't come here to do it? This time, finally, this attempt at comfort wasn't met with another outburst, and Keisha continued as soothingly as she could. Mum... She's going to be in the safest place in the world for at least four years. You just don't get any safer than Herald's Collegium. I mean, think. It's right inside the palace grounds. Think about that. Your daughter is going to be living on the palace grounds and not as a servant either. She'll be back every long holiday. You know she will. After all, you couldn't keep her away. Which one of us always throws herself into the holidays, hmm? Shandi, of course. Just because she's going to be a herald, that doesn't mean she doesn't love her family. Oh, but I'm getting very close to not loving my dear family right now. All of this excitement had given Keisha a pounding headache. She felt as if all her nerves were scraped raw and someone was pouring salt water on them. Her stomach was so sour, she probably wouldn't be able to eat any supper. But Shandi was the baby, my baby sister, the one I looked after and picked up after. And if I didn't have to help calm Mum down, I'd probably be the one bawling like a bereft calf right now. I can't do that and make sure Mum gets through this and starts to look on the bright side. But right now, given the least sign that her mother was getting over her hysterics, or at least that some of her mother's friends were going to come help console her, Keisha would be only too happy to get out of the house and go somewhere, anywhere else. Evidently, she had been good enough and patient enough that for once her unspoken prayers were answered— as if the thought had been a summons, relief came bursting through the kitchen door at that very moment. Sidoni! Ivor! Three of the neighbor women came bursting into the kitchen like a force of nature, all three of them managing to squeeze in at the same time, not waiting to be invited inside. Is it true? A herald? A healer and a herald in the same family? How proud you must be! A healer and a herald, she thought, startled for a moment by the phrasing. Oh my, bless them for noticing. 
Like the people in the market, they were all talking at once. But since there were only three of them, they didn't step all over each other's sentences so much that it all turned into a confused gabble. They surrounded Sidoni and Ivor, faces flushed with excitement at being so close to the great event. Oh, Sidoni, just think, our little Shandi is going to be so important. Sidoni took her face out of her husband's shoulder, and though it was tear-streaked and red with weeping, it seemed that the arrival of her friends pulled her the last few steps out of hysteria. She wiped her face with her apron and began to look more like her normal self. Keisha deemed it practical at that point to remove herself. But she hadn't gotten more than a single step out the door. In fact, she was still standing on the threshold before she ran into another of the Fellowship women, one whom she knew well. Alice was in charge of the health of all of the herds, and as such, she and Keisha had spent plenty of time together dosing the animals for a variety of illnesses and other problems. This afternoon, Alice looked hesitant as she approached the house, and great relief spread over her blunt features when she saw that Keisha was just leaving. Oh, Keisha, I'm sure this is a bad time, but the Chira I was worried about has definitely got wet tail, she began. Keisha didn't give her a chance to say more. She took Alice's elbow and pointed her toward the workshop, just as she spotted four more women bustling in their direction, heading for the Alder House. It's always a bad time when a beast gets sick. You ought to know that, she said, making a joke out of it. They never choose reasonable times to have problems. No worry, I'm going to be the last creature Mum thinks about for a while. Not only will I not be missed, I can make you up what you need in no time. You've caught it early, so you should have a cure by tomorrow. The more distance she got between herself and the house, the better she felt, and chatting with Alice about the beasts of her herds was such a commonplace matter it could not have been a better antidote for the hysteria she'd just endured. Alice was a calming person to be around anyway. She had to be, as the animals she worked with were quick to sense agitation and become upset themselves. She was older than Sidoni by a year or two, sturdy, brown, and square, with a friendly face and open manner. Like all the women of the Fellowship, her workday clothing was fairly drab, not unlike Keisha's, except that the tunic and breeches were of a better fit and not hand-me-downs. The two of them entered the workshop, and Keisha began pulling down the boxes of herbs she needed as Alice went on about the most recent births. The sharp and pungent scents of herbs filled the air as Keisha worked, and the cool of the workshop allowed her headache to ease. It occurred to Keisha that Alice's arrival provided not one, but two excellent excuses for staying away from home for a while. After all, it was spring, and that meant insect season. In particular, the fleas and ticks that would infest the fellowship herds, given half a chance. So as soon as she had finished the wet-tail potion Alice needed, but before the woman could pull out her purse to pay for it, Keisha made her an additional offer. Look, this year I'd like to get ahead of the bugs instead of trying to catch up with them after your beasts are scratching themselves raw, she said, trying to be as persuasive as she knew how. Why don't I make you up some batches of that repellent dip we talked about last year and a good supply of the kill dip? You can try the repellent right away, and if you see it isn't working, you'll be able to dip them all again with the kill before it gets to be a problem. Cautious and frugal as always, Alice wrinkled her forehead and bit her lip cautiously. That would be very helpful, but... Keisha already knew what she was going to say. At the moment, the Fellowship's coffers were pretty bare. 
they wouldn't have made any major sales to traders since the harvest fair two seasons ago. We'll just make it a credit against a shawl trade later for one of my brothers. At least one of them is bound to settle on a girl by harvest. Or, if you'd rather, when the traders get done with you at spring fair, you can pay me then. She grinned and held out her hands. I'd rather have you on credit than have to deal with an infestation like we had three years ago. Alice shuddered and nodded agreement. The fellowship folk normally didn't much care for credit, but as Keisha had known it would, the mere mention of that horrible flea infestation made the difference. It had taken weeks to clear up, and worse, the poor beasts had yielded inferior fleeces that year. Between the cost of the dips and the loss of quality fleeces, the fellowship's steward had been beside himself— Alice had already been beside herself. Anything that caused her beast's pain caused her anguish, too. And since the dips are all made from things I can harvest in the woods right now, rather than things I have to pay for, I can afford to extend them the credit. No sooner agreed than done, making up the batches of sheep dip ate up enough candle marks that by the time Alice left, both arms laden down with baskets packed with jugs, the alder home was full of friends and neighbors to the point where another body could not possibly have squeezed inside. Afternoon sun gilded the kitchen wall as Keisha stood out in the yard and listened for a moment. From the general emotional tenor of the cacophony, Sidoni had gone from grief to pride, as it should be, and now the gathering had all the signs of turning into an impromptu celebration. But Keisha still didn't want to be anywhere near it, and she didn't want to have to deal with the three heartbroken boys either, for all three suitors would be bound to show up on the doorstep of her workshop looking for consolation. At least, she didn't want to deal with them right now. But since I'm out of flea wart, lurch buds, tannin bark, and elo root now, I have the perfect reason to go harvest some. And if they think I am sulking because my sister was chosen and not me, well then, let them think that. Maybe it will make some of them do something nice to comfort me. That way I can get some reward I can call appreciation to make up for the times my generosity was taken advantage of in the past. With a big basket over one arm and harvesting tools in the pockets of her tunic, she set off to the woods to do just that. She took the long way round, using the path that skirted the edge of the fields rather than cutting straight through. Young plants were just starting to show whether they'd be successful or not. The weak ones were ready to be weeded out, and the strong ready for a bit of manure. She exchanged some sort of greeting with everyone working out there as she passed. It was impossible not to. The good thing was that since she was carrying her gathering basket, it was obvious that she had work to do, and there were only a limited number of candle marks before dusk fell. No one would delay her when it might be medicine he would need that she'd be gathering. Self-interest isn't that bad a thing when it comes down to it. We all tend to do things in self-interest, even, maybe especially, when we can couch it in terms of nobility and self-sacrifice. And look, Shandi gets the pretty white horse and a room at the Collegium, while I get Errol's Grove's sicknesses and complaints. The farther she got from the village, the better she felt— she felt her steps growing lighter once she entered the woods proper. Her stomach calmed down, and by the time she reached the lurch bush thicket, she was humming under her breath, and her headache was just about gone. This probably isn't the last time I am going to feel like there's been some kind of injustice over Shandi being chosen and not me, even if I don't really want to be chosen anyway. Besides, I have my own gift, and some appreciation, from some folks, anyway. 
Valdemar wasn't founded on things being fair in life. It was founded on coping with the unfairness of life. The tradition continues, herald or not. The lurch bush was a hardy creature and didn't react badly to having a few of its buds pruned away. A woodpecker trilled just over her head, and as she carefully held each branch and pared every third bud off with a tiny knife, the rich, green scent of lurch sap spread on the air, and she drank it in with pleasure. Each bud went into the hempen bag she had tied to her belt. She dabbed each wound with pitch from an unstoppered jar to seal it and keep insects and fungi from infesting the branches as Steelmind had taught her. Taking care today means plenty tomorrow. That's what he'd said, then smiled, as if at a joke only he understood. When her bag was full, she tied it off, put it in the basket, and went in search of fleawort, a kind of shelf fungus that grew on the fallen bodies of winter-killed trees. For that, she had to seek out trees that were too rotten to use for firewood, whose deaths were due to insects or rot, and not storms. When she returned to the village, basket full, it was already dusk, and the sky had just begun to blossom with stars in the east. The village itself seemed oddly quiet, the houses dark and deserted. Only the faintest threads of smoke came from chimneys that should have been showing evidence of suppers on the hearth. She was puzzled, though not alarmed by the quiet, until she got into the vicinity of the Alder home. Then it was quite obvious where the people had all gone. An enormous party, a kind of extemporaneous spring fair in advance of the actual date, had invaded the house and the lawns and gardens of all the neighbors around it. She watched in some bemusement as her normally sober neighbors acted like adolescents on holiday. The house itself must have been packed to the ceiling since there were people spilling out the door and the celebration perforce had spread into the yard. Evidently, all of Erald's Grove rejoiced in the choosing of one of their own. Well, she thought, it's the most important thing to happen around here since the barbarians. That wasn't exactly pleasant. Afterward, well, even though things came out all right in the end, I imagine no one was in any mood to celebrate anything. What was there to be happy about after all? That only one relative was killed? Or that only half the house burned? That Lord Breon or the Hawk brothers were there at the rescue? Well... All right, perhaps that, but the circumstances eclipsed such elation. By the time any survivors could think clearly, their rescuers were long gone. This cause for the whole village to celebrate is well-timed. Controlled campfires burned in the pottery bowls prescribed for fires within the village bounds, warming the folk gathered around them against the growing chill in the air. Some people were toasting sausages and the like on the ends of sticks, just exactly as they would during the fair. From the wildly varied scents on the breeze and the way everyone seemed to be eating, guzzling, or both, every neighbor had contributed to the impromptu celebration by adding to the provender. There would be no heartbroken former suitors showing up looking for comfort tonight, at least. A celebration was the last place any of them would want to be. They were probably brooding by the river somewhere, or weeping over one of Shandi's ribbons. Or they've given her up completely, and they're chatting up one of the other girls at the party right this moment. When it came down to it, that was the likeliest. Pausing for a moment in the shadows, just outside the circles of light cast by the fires, Keisha pondered just exactly what she wanted to do. Did she really want to be engulfed by a party tonight? Was she in any mood for a loud, boisterous celebration? Granted, she was happy for Shandi, but it wasn't the type of emotion that drove her to go to a party. No, 
she told herself immediately. No, I do not want any part of this. Mum, though, is in the best of hands, and a celebration is just what she needs. It'll turn her right around. Already her head gave her faint intimations of what would happen if she allowed herself to be drawn into the commotion. A quiet night in her workshop, then a little reading before going to sleep, that sounded much more attractive than being plied with wine, babbled at, and staying up until the dawn. As for trying to find a corner of the house where she might be able to get some sleep, that looked pretty impossible. So she reversed her steps and went straight to her workshop, closing the thick door firmly behind her. The heavy stone walls closed her in comfortably, effectively blocking out the noise. She sighed with content and relief and felt her headache fade completely. It didn't take long to get the fire going again, and it was the work of a few moments to get the kettle ready and swing it over the fire to boil. While she waited for her tea, she bundled the herbs and hung them up from hooks in the ceiling to dry, then spread the buds in a drying tray and hung the tray from brackets over the window. By the time she had finished clearing up, the water was ready for tea, and she washed her hands and set to fixing it with a good appetite. She kept a stock of food at the workshop in case she missed a meal at home, and there was more than enough for a fine dinner. Dinner was toasted bread and cheese, with roasted chickpeas and a satisfying and hearty tea with honey. She read a little while she ate, enjoying the luxury of being able to do so, but most of all, she cherished the quiet. After she tidied up, she spent another contented candlemark or two, putting together more of the common remedies she never seemed to have enough of, with special attention to those for headache and queasy stomach, for there were bound to be plenty of those after tonight's indulgence. She changed her mind about reading further, though, after she climbed up into the loft to her cozy feather bed. Instead of reading, she reached over to the shelf beside the bed and picked up her cross-stitch embroidery. At the moment, it was the makings of a fancy blouse. It wasn't that she didn't enjoy pretty things, after all. It was just that they were very impractical for someone in her vocation. On the other hand, she didn't always have to be working, and there were enough celebrations to warrant having pretty clothing. Over the winter, with Shandi's help, she'd picked out a light brown linen for a festival skirt, a lighter beige for a blouse, and had charted out a very pretty pattern in browns and golds for both. The skirt was done. Now she was working on the sleeves and neckline of the blouse— it wouldn't be finished for spring fair, but it probably would be for midsummer. Cross stitch, regular geometric patterns, that is, was very soothing, she had found. It allowed her mind to drift to other subjects, and sometimes, as she worked, she was able to come up with answers to problems she needed to solve. As she worked her needle through the linen tonight, she found herself wondering where Shandi was right at the moment. Would she be at an inn, I wonder? Or would that companion take her to a way station instead? In either case, Shandi would make herself at home. No one could resist her smile and her open friendliness, so she would be a welcome guest at an inn, doubly so as newly chosen. She'd probably be treated like a person of importance and wouldn't have to lift a finger for herself. If, on the other hand, she was at a way station, she'd have herself tucked up snugly in no time at all. From all that Keisha understood, way stations were well provided for. Shandi was more of a housekeeper and cook than Keisha was. It was not as if Shandi would have to sleep out of doors supperless. That might be why the companion was in such a hurry to leave, Keisha realized. They probably had a long way to go before they came to either an inn or a way station. 
That would be a good thing to remind her mother of tomorrow if Sidoni felt slighted that Shandi had left without waiting to say goodbye. By now, I'll bet Shandi's probably wishing she waited long enough to gather up her work basket, she thought with a chuckle. I've never seen her sitting down without something to work on in her hands. Well, there ought to be at least one trader from Haven here at the fair. I'll box up all her handiwork and send it off to her with him. With luck, I may be able to send her some scarlet thread as well. Would she be lonely, all by herself, in a little way station? Probably not. She'd have the companion, after all, and everyone knew that companions and heralds had a special bond that was as close as anything two humans could have. I wonder if she can mind-speak to him. I wonder what that would be like. Marvelous, but maybe a little scary. At least, that's what she thought it might be like for her. Did Shandi miss Keisha? I certainly miss her already. Brothers just aren't the same as sisters. It was hard to think of what things would be like without her. She found herself nodding over her work, so she folded the blouse pieces carefully, putting them away in her work basket and stowing everything on the shelf beside her bed. She blew out her candle and curled up, and even as she wondered if Shandi was awake or dreaming, she fell asleep. 2. Morning broke clear and cool, with shreds of fog drifting above the fields and birds singing with all their hearts in the thatch of Keisha's roof. The faint hint of wood smoke mingled with fresh air laden with the perfume of spring flowers and the tang of new leaves. Normally she woke to the odor of cooking porridge or pancakes. Keisha's nose, which was all that was peeking out from under the covers, was cold. She preferred to sleep with a window open. The birds woke her, and her cold nose twitched at the unaccustomed aromas. All the rest she saw from the small open window in her loft bedroom. She stretched luxuriously and snuggled underneath her down comforter and blankets, enjoying the simple pleasure of lying abed for as long as she cared to. Had she been at home this morning, she'd have been rudely jarred awake before dawn by the noise of five clumsy young men stumbling about the house, getting fed and ready to go to work. They couldn't seem to accomplish this simple task without a great deal of hunting for boots and clothing, accompanied by shouting questions to each other concerning the location of those articles. Once awake, there was no point in even trying to go back to sleep, since Sidoni would come roust Keisha out to help with household chores before she joined her husband and sons on the farm. Instead of being jolted awake, Keisha had been serenaded awake, and after dawn, not before. Instead of being hauled off to wash dishes, or, dear gods, pick up after last night's enormous party, she had enjoyed absolutely undisturbed sleep. Of course, the penalty for this is that I have to make my own breakfast and heat my own wash water, but I think that's a fair trade. Given that Shandi was gone, there would have been twice the work to do on a normal morning, and after the celebration last night, well, the amount of cleaning up didn't bear thinking about. And would Sidoni even consider taking care of the cleanup gradually, say, by putting off things like floor washing and yard cleanup for a few days? Not a chance. Sidoni would insist that it all be done at once. Well, with neither Shandi nor Keisha there, maybe she'd finally get the boys to do their own share of the work. After all, each one of them made more mess than Shandi and Keisha put together. It certainly wouldn't hurt them to start taking care of themselves. Maybe they'd start being more careful if they had to take care of the consequences of their own laziness. That was a satisfying thought. Well... 
What have I got left here to wear? How long ago did I bring things over? She took a quick mental inventory. Since the last time she'd brought in cleaned smocks and breeches, she hadn't had any major injuries to deal with, so all three outfits were still here. Good. She always kept at least one spare outfit here, in case she got particularly bloodied. Sidoni had an aversion to seeing her daughter come in with blood stains on her clothing, though she had no such problem with the same stains on her son's. Why was that? Sidoni had no fear of blood. She'd been born and raised on a farm. She was a farmer's wife, and the spillage of blood was part of farm life. Besides, women weren't exactly strangers to blood themselves. She sat up a little more and wrapped one of her blankets around her shoulders. As she propped her knees up, one possibility came to her. You know, it occurs to me that Mum's problem is less with blood stains and more with the notion that it isn't ladylike for a girl to do things that would get her hands bloodied on a regular basis. I mean, even at slaughtering time, Mum doesn't get into the butchering until the carcasses have been bled out and gutted. That brought up some new things to think about. With Shandi gone, Sidoni would only have one female child to concentrate on rather than two. Now, that meant more than simply having the number of domestic helpers halved. Shandi had been as dainty and ladylike as her mother could have wished, relieving Keisha of the need to be either of those things. Now, though, now she's going to be at me to get a suitor, to act like a proper lady, to start having children. Besides all the chores, she'll want me to spend my free time doing needlework and making pretty clothes, putting together a dower chest, not studying my books or making medicines. She groaned softly. It seemed that Shandi had saved her from more than she ever realized. Just by being there and being what she was, Shandi had kept their mother's attention fixed on her— leaving Keisha freer than she would be now. I'd thought my life was complicated before. It was so hard to balance all the demands that were made on her. If they had their way, her parents wanted her to help with the domestic chores, the farm work, get married, have children. As far as the people of Erold's Grove were concerned, the village folk wanted her to concentrate on nothing but their injuries and ailments, or the hurts and illnesses of their animals. Not that I don't prefer the animals when it comes to that. They don't spend most of their time complaining. But that was unkind. Of course people complained. It kept them from feeling quite so afraid. When they were sick or hurt... They lost control over their very selves, as they perceived them, and had to rely on the skills and tools of someone else. So it was only natural that they would complain. Up to a point, the more they complained, the more frightened they were known to be. Past that point, they're too paralyzed with fear to do anything. I guess I should be grateful that they're still complaining. Handling the dead is worse than listening to the living. Healer Gill, on the other hand, never lost the opportunity to let her know that he still felt she should be at the Collegium, that he had no real confidence in her ability to get beyond herb and knife healing if she didn't go. Well, he's got a good point there. I am making no headway with those books. How I wish that old wizard Justin was still around. Surely he could have helped me make sense of those pages. Perhaps she would have to go. But who would take over for her? Could she train someone like Alice? Oh, no one would take this on who wasn't a volunteer, and if anyone had been willing to volunteer before, they wouldn't have needed me. As for Alice, she'd made it quite clear that she was in no way willing to extend her services beyond the animals in her charge. Not that I blame her. She is far more reticent and shy than I am. Now, 
How was she to reconcile all these differing plans for her future? Obviously, someone was going to be angry with her, no matter what she did. Something else occurred to her as she worried at her thoughts like a puppy with a bit of rag. This was the first morning in months when she hadn't woken up with the claustrophobic feeling that her entire family was closing in on her. It always seems as if they're right beside me, breathing over my shoulder, even when they're in the next room. Now, that might have been because the cubby she had shared with Shandi was scarcely bigger than a closet. But it might not. People are all beginning to irritate me lately. How many times have I gotten away from someone feeling as if they've been rubbing my nerves raw? How many times have I wanted to shove them away? For that matter, how many times have I been feeling as sick as the person I was treating until I got away from them? Not that she was all that comfortable around people. That had always been Shandi's gift. Shandi could make a friend out of a stranger in the space of a few words— unless Keisha was giving explicit instructions to someone or bargaining with a merchant, she always felt tongue-tied and awkward with strangers and friends alike. She actually preferred to be around the sick and injured in a way, because then she had complete control over the situation. For that matter, you couldn't really say that I actually have friends, not like Shandi's. For me, a friend is someone I can get along with, like Alice of the Fellowship. But you don't see her inviting me to dinner or sharing confidences. She had to chuckle a little at that, despite the morose turn of her thoughts. Sharing confidences, indeed. And what sort of confidences would Alice be likely to share? Stories about the love lives of the Chiras? Still and all, maybe that was why she got along better with Alice than her neighbors or her family. Neither of us is very good with people. Animals are simpler, I suppose. Animals certainly have less complicated emotions and are never upset when you say the wrong thing. In the thin, clear light of dawn, she saw yet another, whole new side of Shandi that she hadn't really expected. Shandi as her guardian. In retrospect, Shandi had spent a lot of time protecting her from having to deal with other people in day-to-day -day matters. A thousand memories came flooding back of Shandi responding to silent summons or unspoken entreaties as if she heard them, and taking the attention of others off Keisha with a word or a laugh. And Shandi spent a lot of time keeping Mum and Da from worrying at me. How had she not noticed all this time? And now, what was she going to do without that protection? She frowned at herself for being such a coward. Cope, that's what I'll do. I'm a big girl. She would just have to steel herself and learn how to interact socially with other people. She wasn't stupid, after all. She could learn. For a moment, though, it almost seemed as if her best option would be to travel to Haven in Shandi's wake and enroll in Healer's Collegium. Oh, yes, and just how am I to do that? I've nowhere near enough money to travel that far, and there's no magic companion to carry me off and see that I don't get into trouble along the way. No. That was a specious argument, and she knew it. Lord Breon would not only give her the money to travel on, he'd probably assign one of his guards and two horses to take her there. And if he wouldn't, she had only to get as far as the nearest house of healing, and the healers there would see to it. That was the trouble with arguing with herself. She had to be honest. She chuckled sourly and adjusted her blanket— I'm so bad with people, I can't even win an argument with myself. All right, the obvious problem of leaving her people without someone at least marginally qualified to help them was an excuse. She had to face it. The real reason she didn't want to go was, I don't want to leave. To go off somewhere among total strangers for at least two years to some huge city where I would be totally lost— 
The very idea made her skin crawl. All those strangers, and nowhere she would know to go where she could escape them. All those strangers. Oh, gods, no. And it's no good to say that at least Shandi would be there, because she's going to be at Harold's Collegium. She'll be so busy becoming a Herald that she'd be just as far from me there as she is now. She just was not like her sister. She didn't make friends easily, and she never would. She'd get so tongue-tied with the people at Healer's Collegium that they'd probably think she was feeble-minded. It could be months before I managed to say anything sensible to strangers, and I'd be so lonely. The larger the crowd around her, especially of strangers, the more she withdrew and wanted to hide. The only time she didn't feel that way was when she was on ground familiar to her, actually or metaphorically. She was able to make desultory conversation with people she knew, with strangers in her own home, or if the topic had to do with things she already knew. At the fairs, she invariably hung around the outskirts. At celebrations, well, generally she did exactly what she'd done last night, go to bed early. I'm just no good at social chit-chat, I suppose. She was absolutely certain her own nature would condemn her among the expert teachers at Healer's Collegium. Until they actually gave me something that I already knew how to do, I'd look like a right idiot. I know it. And worse, I'd sound like one, too. She could just imagine being called on in a class to recite something from a lesson. It would be worse than when she'd had her lessons with the other village children. The old woman who'd taught them had soon learned not to call on Keisha for any recitations. Any time she'd wanted to know what Keisha had learned, she'd have Keisha write it out. But that was here. They wouldn't give me that kind of special consideration at the Collegium. How could they? I'd be nothing special there, just another student, not someone they were going to rely on to tend their ills. Shandi, on the other hand, would be fine in Haven, even without the companion. That's what Mum doesn't understand about Shandi. Everyone likes Shandi at first sight and goes out of their way to help her. They always have and probably always will. That's why she has so many suitors. They all think they're in love with her just because she smiles at them and they're enchanted. They don't realize that they feel that way because she's just that way and can't help being so nice to them that it makes them feel as if she's nice only to them. Shandi has always assumed the best of everything, everyone, and every situation, and more often than not, they live up to it. Keisha shook her head and reckoned that she must have been born somber, or at least without humor. Without humor, I suppose. I never can see what most jokes are about. Havens, I generally can't tell when someone is telling a joke, and no one seems able to figure me out that I don't really enjoy noise and carrying on like everyone else seems to. Even her mother complained constantly that Keisha was far too inscrutable, and that she could never tell what Keisha was thinking or feeling. Not that Keisha always wanted her to be able to do so. If Mum knew what I was thinking, oh, would I ever get in trouble. But she also complained that Keisha was always taking everything too seriously. So did her brothers. And so, for that matter, did her father, even though he seldom complained about or even commented on anything. Am I putting people off? I suppose I must be. Well, just look at the difference between the number of suitors Shandi had and the number none that Keisha had. There's no other reason why. Shandi and I look an awful lot alike. We share similar features, the same hair and eye color, and her figure is no better than mine. Oh, granted, she does generally dress better than I do, but I've worn pretty things without getting the attention she gets. It has to be that I'm putting people off. Now she had to ask herself, as she often did, Am I jealous of Shandi?
She thought back over the selection of young men available in Errol's Grove and shook her head, thought about the sort of things that Shandi and her friends did for amusement and knew she'd be utterly bored. No, I'm absolutely not jealous. There's only so much discussion of bodices and embroidery patterns that I can stand. And as for coquetting and flirting about, why bother? No. It was just another sign that she just didn't fit in with other people. Without Shandi's vivacity, animation, and sunny smiles, Keisha attracted about as much attention as a piece of furniture. Which is, after all, the way I prefer things. How would I get anything done if I had young men mooning around after me the way they follow Shandi about? What a nuisance! So she wasn't entirely unhappy with the situation. Not entirely. It would have been nice to have one friend or one suitor. Someone sensible. Someone she could actually have a conversation with. Someone who had an interesting life of his own. Well, this is wasting time. I've been slothful long enough. She threw off the blankets and flung open the lid of the chest that shared the loft with her bed. Quickly she got out clean clothing and just as quickly scrambled into another oversized tunic and worn pair of breeches, shivering in the chilly air. She half-climbed, half-slid down the ladder to the main room, ducked her head under the pump at the sink and performed a shivery wash-up, then stirred up the fire. In a reasonable length of time, the room was warm, and a decent breakfast of bread and butter and tea was inside her. She put three eggs on to boil, picked out a withered apple to finish her breakfast, and with a grimace of determination, opened the book still on the bench to the last place she'd gotten stuck. It was time to go to work. She was interrupted four times before she gave up, still baffled by references to shields and grounds. Once it was because she had to take the eggs off to cool, three times because children came knocking on her door with injuries. By then she was hungry again and threw together a salad of young greens from her garden to eat with her eggs. When she'd washed up afterward, she tidied up the workshop, then looked around and sighed. She couldn't put it off any longer. She had to go back to the house. Bother. Knowing that with all the work last night's celebration had generated, Sidoni would still be at home, her conscience goaded her into going back to pick up some of the work. I can't say my fair share, since I wasn't generating any of the mess, but it's not fair to leave Mum with all of it, I suppose. With reluctant steps, she made her way back through the village, to be greeted at the door with the expected... Where have you been? From her mother at the sink, up to her elbows in soap and water. Working, Mum, and studying. She didn't feel any guilt over that. After all, that was her job. And although she didn't put on a defiant air, she did face her mother's eyes squarely. Sidoni sighed. Well, next time the entire village decides to celebrate something, I hope they choose someone else's house. I've been here all day, and I'm beginning to think we ought to move back to the farm. Well, I'd have to stay here, Keisha began, and her mother interrupted her. I know, and that's why I haven't said anything to your father. Sidoni rinsed a plate and stacked it with the rest to dry. Go clean up the yard, would you? I've been that busy in the house, I haven't had time to get to it. Since that was a better job than washing dishes, by Keisha's way of thinking, she was perfectly happy to go back outside and take care of the tidying up. It was rather amazing the amount of trash people could generate. Portable fireplaces had just been tipped over, and the cold coals and ashes dumped before their owners carried the fireplace home, for instance— Sticks used to toast sausages were just littered about, and bits of kindling, the odd kerchief or scarf, and a wooden cup. 
The village dogs had already taken care of discarded food, and what they hadn't gobbled up, the crows had. Good enough reason to put off cleanup. Keisha worked her way methodically across the yard. Coals and kindling went into the alder's own kindling stack. Ashes were scooped thriftily onto the flower border, and other folks' belongings placed on a window ledge where the owners would presumably find them. She swept gravel back onto the path, put ornamental stones back along the border, and put the tiny plot of herb garden back to rights. Where markers had been inadvertently knocked over or flattened, she replaced them. Where sticky stuff of unknown origin had been spilled, she dusted a little ash over it so it wouldn't attract insects. She just finished when her mother emerged, bearing a basket full of wet clothing. Sidoni thrust it into her hands and bustled back into the house without a word. Oh dear, I suppose she's pretty irritated with me. Better say nothing, then, and stay out of further trouble. She took the heavy load of clothes and set it down next to the rosemary hedge. Sidoni had her own order of things— one that was not to be deviated from. Keisha followed that order as faithfully as any medicinal recipe. She spread shirts and underthings on the top of the hedge where the sun would bleach them. Since today there was little or no breeze, there was no need to pin each garment to a branch to keep it from flying away. Stockings and breeches she pinned to the clothesline with wooden pegs her brothers carved during long winter nights, but they had to go on the section of line that would be in the sun. Anything embroidered or made with colored cloth went on the line in the shade to preserve those precious colors. When she did her own laundry, everything went on the line regardless— but Sidoni felt that the shirts and other white things got more sun if they were laid flat on the hedge. Not that it would matter all that much with my clothing. Sidoni came out twice more with baskets full of wet clothing. By the time Keisha was done, there wasn't a single bud or stem visible on the hedge, and clothing on the line had been double-pinned, two garments sharing the same space— when Keisha brought back the third basket empty, Sidoni met her at the door with the alder's lone bit of carpet and a brush. No need to ask what that was for, either. Keisha took it downwind of the drying laundry, out to the railings of the neighbor's fence, and laid it over the top rail. She brushed and beat the bit of rug until no more dirt or mud would come out of it, and her arms were tired. She brought both back, and this time her mother accepted them with a smile. She smiled back, relieved. Evidently, she'd performed enough penance. Here, go sweep up, Sidoni told her, handing her the broom. I seem to have all our dishes, and most of our neighbors as well. And Sidoni would never return so much as a cup if it was still soiled. Keisha ventured an opinion. Mum... Why aren't the boys helping you? she asked, digging the broom into the cracks of the wooden floor to dislodge crumbs that would attract mice. They make more than their share of mess, and it wouldn't hurt them to help. At Sidoni's quizzical look, she added slyly, And they're stronger. They could really do a good job of scrubbing. Oh, they're such clumsy louts, Sidoni began, but she sounded doubtful this time and Keisha took advantage of that doubt to press her point home. I wouldn't trust them to do dishes or to wash good clothes, but they can't hurt anything scrubbing floors and walls or washing sheets and their own clothing. Maybe if they had to scrub their own clothes, they wouldn't be so quick to get stains all over them. Her mother laughed. Isn't that the pot saying the kettle's black? she asked gently. Keisha snorted. At least my stains come from work, not drinking wine and beer with my friends. And what's more, I do scrub my own. I've never asked you to do it, not since I started this healing business. She warmed to her subject. What's more, I never get stains on my good clothes. 
You never wear your good clothes, Sidoni pointed out. Because I'd get stains on them, she countered, and I do wear them, just not every other day to impress some girl. I just think they'd be more careful if they knew they'd be the ones doing the work. This time, instead of dismissing the idea, her mother actually looked as if she was thinking about it, and thinking about the fact that half her workforce was gone, and the other half, as she'd discovered this morning, was not always reliably available. You might have a point, dear, was all she said, but Keisha was encouraged. Would you go pack up Shandy's things for me? Reuven of the Fellowship says that there will be a trader for their shawls and trims coming straight from Haven and going straight back after the fair, and he'll take Shandy some packages, probably in exchange for her embroidery threads. Then I'll give him a little more incentive, Keisha told her. Shandy and I had gotten some scarlet dye. I'll go ahead and make up some thread. You know how hard it is to get scarlet, and that should seal the bargain. Oh, now that would be a help, Sidoni replied, brightening, since, as Keisha knew, the trader would probably ask for a coin or two as well, and this would save the older household from having to part with those hard-earned coins. Just try not to get your hands all red this time, dear." Keisha pretended she hadn't heard that last, as she went to the back of the house to the little cubby bedroom she shared with Shandy. After all, it had been ages since the incident when she dyed her hands with red ochre, and how was she supposed to know the stuff had to wear off? It had been her first experiment with dye for Shandy. Shandy was so neat that it didn't take long to make her things up into a few tightly packed packages. Keisha left her a generous supply of embroidery threads for her own use, but kept out the rest to use to bargain with the trader. Shandy's friends would just have to find another source for their threads from now on. Or they can spin their own and pay me to dye them. She also kept all of the undyed spun thread. Not only was she going to dye as much of it scarlet as she could tonight, but she intended to make that experiment with over-dyeing in indigo and see if that didn't make a purple. I'll have to dry it in the workshop, though, and without a fire. In fact, I'd better dye it before dark so I don't have to use a candle. The fumes could be dangerous." She was just as glad that she was the one doing this batch of dye and not Shandy. She wasn't certain she could have impressed on Shandy just how dangerous those fumes could be in close quarters. None of the dyes Shandy had used until now needed anything but water and a solvent followed by a fixative, and none was poisonous unless you were stupid enough to drink it. But my medicines can be very poisonous— the bruise potion, for instance, or the joint ache rub, they could both kill you if you weren't careful. She paused for a moment to admire Shandy's undyed threads, the wool, the linen, and the special baby Chira wool that she got from the fellowship. No one in the village could spin a tighter, smoother thread than Shandy, and no one made thread better suited to embroidery. Shandy's threads were not inclined to knot, break, or catch. That was why everyone liked them. But Andy is almost as good, and this will just give her incentive to do better. When Keisha had finished, there was just enough daylight left to do the dyeing that she'd decided on. She took the hanks of undyed thread, left the packages on Shandy's bed, and headed out the door at a fast walk before Sidoni could recruit her to help with dinner. "'I've got something I have to do, Mum,' she called as she went out the door. "'I'll be back for dinner.' She got herself out of shouting distance by breaking into a run as soon as she let the door slam behind her, thus making it possible to claim that she hadn't heard Sidoni if a reproach was to come over dinner. She closed the door of her workshop behind her and leaned against it for a moment, conscious of a profound feeling that she had reached a sanctuary 
and guilty for having that feeling. Then she dismissed both emotions, caught up in the excitement of having something new to experiment with. The pouch with the dye in it waited in a patch of sunlight on the workbench, and she had the rest of the afternoon before her. She quit only when it was getting darkish, and the fumes from the dying thread made her feel as if she'd drunk three glasses of wine and then hit herself in the head with the bottle. By then, the last couple of hanks came out noticeably lighter than the others, which meant that the dye was losing strength. That's all right, she thought, as she hung them to dry with the rest, along the line where she usually hung bunches of herbs to dry. They'll either be a nice rose pink, or I can use them for that over-dyeing experiment. She had more than enough thread to make the trader willing to seal the bargain, and she'd used up three-quarters of the dye to do it. If Shandi's friends complained, she'd had enough dye left to dye their spinning, which wasn't good enough to tempt a trader. That's a reasonable compromise, I think. She'd been careful to dye equal amounts of all three kinds of thread, too— linen for embroidering on light fabrics, sheep's wool for tapestry work on canvas, such as high-born ladies indulged in, or for embroidering woolen clothing and leather, and chira wool for work on heavier fabrics than linen. She made sure all the windows of the workshop were open before she left— by morning, the fumes should be gone and the threads dry. Her work was probably not quite as perfect as Shandi's, for her sister would make certain that every skein in a dye lot matched and discard the dyeing solution as soon as the color showed any sign of weakening. But as rare as a good scarlet was, she doubted that would matter. As she left the workshop, she was gratified to see that she had managed not to get any of that scarlet dye on herself. She'd thought about discarding the dregs, then thought better of it, sealing the bowl with another placed upside down atop it. If those last skeins came out pink, it might be worth the trouble to keep dyeing, letting the color grow fainter and fainter as long as it stayed color fast. Shandi did that with indigo, and the girls loved being able to do subtle shadings with the results, producing flowers that looked real enough to pick. Dinner was already on the table when Keisha arrived, and there were no reproaches for her from Sidoni when she pulled up her stool and helped herself to bread and soup. Her father picked up what was obviously a conversation in progress before she arrived. Nah, then, he said, looking pointedly at Tell, the middlemost of the five boys. It's about time you started helping out your mom like. You're of an age, and you think she's been put in the world to be your servant? Not likely, then. Keisha kept her head and eyes down and ate quickly. The expressions on her brother's faces had ranged from astonished to offended, sullen to rebellious. This did not bode well for her. "'What about Keisha?' asked Rondi, the oldest, whose expression had been the offended one. "'She's a girl, and it's her place—' "'My place? Oh, really?' Keisha thought, anger rising." Keisha was here doing her share and yours today, for you were lazing about with your friends this afternoon, Sidoni snapped. Trish saw you, so you needn't deny it and say you were working. And as for talk about place, I'd like to know where you got ideas like that, Ivor said, with some heat of his own. There's no places in this family unless I put you in it and I won't hear any more nonsense like that, talking about your sister that way. It wasn't you that was chosen, was it? And maybe now your mouth has just given us the reason why. Keisha risked a glance out of the corner of her eye and saw Rondi redden to the same glorious scarlet hue that she dyed into the threads. 
As to places, you might take thought, you boys, as to who's going to be doing your cooking and cleaning when your mum is gone and your reputations keep any girl from wanting to take you as a husband, hmm? Ivor chuckled, and Sidoni continued that line of thought. Oh, indeed. Let me tell you that there isn't a girl in this village who'd wed a man who's likely to treat her as his private servant, she snapped. And as for me, I may well stop keeping house before I die. I won't be spry forever, you know. Your good Da knows how to care for himself, but you lazy louts can count on it that he won't be waiting hand and foot on you. So there you have it, lads. No choice for you, Ivor chuckled again, quite heartlessly, and Keisha almost choked on her soup, suppressing a chuckle of her own. You'll be doing your own wash and picking up from now on, and each of you will take a turn at the dishes and cooking supper. If you don't want to cook, you can buy a meat pie or pasties from the baker, or pay a neighbor to make a soup. If you don't like having to share the chores, you're free to find some other household that will take you in, or live in the woods. The groans that arose from his words were heart-rending, but Ivor's word was law and the boys knew it. Keisha finished her portion quickly and took her bowl to the sink. Much as she disliked doing dishes, she decided it would be politic to volunteer tonight, and began on the soup pot and cooking utensils already waiting there. Evidently, the boys hadn't figured out that she was the source of their new chores— or else they were hoping for an ally because they were decent to her when they brought her their bowls. That was certainly a relief, and Sidoni's quick hug when she brought the rest of the dishes was a welcome surprise. I know you've been worked hard, lovey, and you haven't complained about it till now, her mother said in her ear, and it isn't fair, not when the town depends so much on you. You're a bit young to have that on your shoulders, and I keep forgetting that you're more than just my little girl, and I know you kept getting lost in Shandi's shadow. That wasn't fair either. Keisha had often wished she could go off into the woods to live as a hermit, but not at that moment. She flushed and smiled at her mother. It's all right. Now that the boys are going to pitch in to help, she said, then an awful thought occurred to her. You aren't really going to make them cook, are you? Sidoni laughed. If they give up one night in the tavern, they'll have enough to buy us all supper for that night, she pointed out. And if they really want to cook, I'll be overseeing everything to make certain what comes out in the end isn't going to poison us. Oh, good. Keisha heaved a sigh of relief and rinsed the last spoon. Oh, I got you a rose vine from Steel Mind yesterday. I'll plant it tomorrow. Where do you want it? Sidoni beamed and gave her another hug. And I just this afternoon thought about putting up a trellis by the bedroom window, and I was wondering what to train on it. There, please, lovey. Going to study before you go to sleep? Of course, she replied with wry resignation. What else? Then you might as well take the kitchen candle with you, her mother replied, and kissed her on the cheek. Good night, sweet. She took the proffered candle and went to her little cubby, now strangely empty without Shandi, but scented with her favorite herbs. She studied until her eyes grew too heavy to keep open, then blew out the candle and pulled the blankets over her head to block out the snores and grunts of her brothers. Tonight, as she fell asleep, her thoughts were not of Shandi, but about the old wizard, Justin. She'd never seen him. They were too far out in the country for a child to come into town, and she'd never been sick enough to need his attentions. She wished that she had known him. For all that her parents loved her, they still didn't really understand her. It's the feeling the feeling I have that's so strong that I have to help people. Like seeing two ends of rope and wanting to tie them, just because they are there, as if they are somehow incomplete until I join them. 
It's as strong as needing to breathe or eat, and they just don't grasp that. I can't help myself. I never could. When someone is hurt or sick, I have to help them no matter what. She had the feeling that he would have understood her, though. Or else, why would he have stayed and stayed during all the years when he was disregarded? He had that feeling, too. He must have. Oh, how I wish he were here now, to teach me all the things I don't know. 3. Hooves made very little sound on leaf-littered forest floor, which was a welcome change to everyone from the steady clicking of dihele hooves on roads packed rock-hard from generations of use. And after four years of so-called normal forests and entirely domesticated Valdemaran fields, Darion Firkin was glad to see a forest that looked normal to him. It's so good to be on home territory again. Trees so tall you can't see the tops from the ground, with trunks so big it takes three men to circle them. This is more like it. He didn't crane his neck and gawk upward the way a foreigner would, but all the same he was very aware of how high the trees above him reached, simply by virtue of the fact that he had to look up before he saw any branches springing from the huge trunks standing all around him. Darion had grown up on the edge of the Pelagirs, and what the Valdemarans seemed to think of as proper-sized trees looked like saplings to him. Most of his life had been spent in the forests with his trapper parents, rather than in his home village of Erald's Grove, and he felt as comfortable among trees as did his adopted hawk brother kin. Oh, it's very, very good to be home. Now I don't feel as if the sky is going to swallow me up. Despite the pleasure he took in his surroundings, he remained alert. The rest of the team rode ahead of Darion. He usually rode tail guard, and he took his responsibility seriously. They were all on their way home now. Not to Erald's Grove, at least not immediately, but to Kevala Vale. This little group of Taledras, one of many, be it added, had taken on the task of spending four years away from their vale for the purpose of cleansing some of the northernmost Valdemaran territories of pockets of trouble left over from the mage storms that had swept the entire world a few years ago. Darion had personal experience of the storms and of their results, most of which were anything but beneficial, and he could see why the Valdemarans needed help with it. Trouble could take many forms. Bizarre creatures, warped and twisted from ordinary animals, dangerous animals imported from some other far lands within the area of change circles, even pools of magical energy with the potential to affect anything that fell into it. And while they were at it, they were establishing new ley lines and nodes, or re-establishing old ones, so that magical energies, just like rainwater, could again flow into and through convenient channels. He smiled to himself, shrugging the quiver on his back into a more comfortable position. It tended to ride down a little. Not that they wouldn't establish their own eventually— but I rather fear my adoptive kin have a passion for neatness in magic. It was no accident that the ley lines and nodes established in or near Taledras territory all fed into Taledras heartstones, for instance, instead of messily running this way and that without any consideration for the convenience of the would-be users. For, as all mages knew to their sorrow, the mage storms had disrupted everything, spreading magic, much like a fall of freezing rain, evenly across the face of the world. For the most part, magic collected in nodes or stored in objects had been dispersed as effectively as all the rest, 
Some few reservoirs had been shielded and saved, most notably the heartstones of the Taledras Vales. But when the storms were over, those reservoirs no longer had sources to replenish them. By re-establishing the ley lines, mages of the level of master and above would eventually have reliable and powerful sources of energy to tap into. Eventually, though, that was the key. It would take time for enough magical energy to trickle into those channels and collect again. For now, as Darion's very first teacher had told him, the powerful magics that adepts and even masters had been able to perform were things of the past. There just wasn't enough readily available, amassed energy available to perform them. He had heard it spoken of as fog by starfall. Sure, there might be enough water in a barn-sized mass of fog, but it did you no good if you wanted a drink of water. Well, that's almost true. If three or four mages got together and pooled their personal power, you could do one fairly impressive piece of work. But you couldn't hold it for long, and the mages would be useless for a week after, or worse, they'd be dead, which is certainly a scandalously wasteful use of mages, and one which the mages would probably object to. The faint sound of a twig snapping behind them made him swivel to peer back along their trail, only to see a deer in the far distance stare back at him, then bound away out of sight. By adept Starfall's way of thinking, even leaving mages exhausted and drained was just a little too expensive a price for a temporary achievement— Darion tended to agree, at least in principle, though he could think of a few occasions when it might be worth it. On the whole, he preferred Starfall's precept that it was better and more effective to use small magics cleverly than big ones clumsily. Kuari, he mind-called to his bond bird, anything back there but deer? Fox, tree hare. Was squirrel tasty, too? Kuari's mind voice was overlaid with sated pleasure, but it wasn't as intense as it would have been if he'd stuffed himself. Do me a favor and circle a bit, then come back to the line. Something had caused that deer to come out of cover. It might have been the animal's own curiosity, but if it wasn't, Darion wanted to know the cause. Kuari gave willing assent, and Darion's thoughts returned to their original track. After helping to defeat a barbarian army that had decimated the countryside and occupied Erold's Grove, Darion had been formally adopted by mage scout Snowfire as his younger brother, and had left the area he'd known all his life to follow his new kindred. The Taledras, as a whole, had made a treaty agreement with Valdemar to cleanse their land in return for payment. Each clan and vale that sent one or more teams out would decide just what form the payment for their team would take. In the case of Kevala, it would be in the form of raw materials, such as wool, linen, metals, and the like, especially metals— Taledras disliked mining, and without the magical means to bring metals to the surface, mining was the only way to get them. As to why it was the Taledras and not the Valdemarans themselves that were cleansing the land, well, as Darion had learned, the Valdemarans were unaccustomed to magic use in the first place, and in the second place the Taledras were uniquely suited to the task— in the first set of mage storms, in the wake of the mage wars of Ertho and Ma'ar, the Taledras had taken on the task of cleansing the lands at the behest of their goddess, and had been given unique traits, skills, and knowledge to enable them to do so. Interesting that they managed to come up with a tradition of running off strangers at knife point all by themselves, though, and not at the goddess's orders, he thought, casting an amused glance at his adoptive brother's back. 
Well, some people take their jobs more seriously than others. I wonder if the Shinayin are just as bloodthirsty. The other reason lay in Valdemar itself. In the time of Harold Vaniel, a spell had been set that prevented knowledge of true magic from taking hold in the minds of Valdemarans, along with another guaranteed to send any true mage mad if he worked his powers within the borders of Valdemar. Those spells were gone now, of course. They would never have survived the mage storms, even if they hadn't been taken down deliberately. But centuries of living without real magic had left the Valdemarans without many mages of their own. Darion understood that mages were being trained at the capital of Haven, under the auspices of adept Darkwind and herald mage Elspeth, among others, and like Darion, not all of those were heralds, or even human. They were taking things slowly, however. There were many pitfalls to avoid, not the least of which was to make very certain that no ally got the impression that Valdemar was trying to build itself an army of mages. There was talk of establishing a fourth circle, a mage circle, just like the bardic circle, heraldic circle and healer circle, and a proper and separate mages' collegium. I don't know how far they'll get with that one, though. Some of the teachers are bound to be mages from established schools. Will they be willing to give over students into something like that? Then again, the point was to instill ethics into young mages from the beginning. And what sane mage would argue with that? That was all complicated political matters, and not of much interest to him at the moment. Right now, he was just glad to be riding beneath the shadow of his much-loved trees, with the familiar pine and fallen leaf scent of home all around him. One of the heralds they had worked with during their task had once been on the circuit that included Erold's Grove, and had told Darion that the huge trees of the Pelagiris always reminded him of the huge columns of the great temple of Vicandus in Kars. It struck Darion, then and now, that this was a particularly apt description. The hush beneath the trees, with the calls of birds so high above, and shafts of golden sunlight piercing the occasional breaks in the foliage, always filled him with peace, pleasure, and a touch of awe or wonder. He couldn't imagine a temple or cathedral of any kind that deserved the name that wouldn't evoke a similar set of feelings. The group followed a faint but discernible path in the shadows of those trees, riding not the horses of the Valdemarans, nor the companions of their heralds, but Dihili, strong and slender deer-like creatures with twin curving horns and a formidable intelligence. They were, in fact, not beasts of burden, but allies of the Taledras and their equals in intelligence. Though they did not bond with a particular person in the way that a companion would bond with a herald, they did express preferences in riders, and Darion's mount was, oddly enough, the king's stag of the herd, Tercel. One would think that the king's stag would be carrying one of the two leaders of the group, either Adept, Starfall, or Snowfire. Now why should I do that? Tercel asked ironically, when you are so very much lighter than they. The Daihili turned his head a little on his long neck so that one wickedly amused golden eye looked back at Darion. He wasn't at all surprised that Tercel had been following his thoughts. Daihili, in general, were the strongest mind-speakers of any creature alive, and the king stags were the strongest of the strong. Daihili had no concept of the privacy of thoughts, either, so they had no scruples about eavesdropping. Not that Darion cared. 
in their way, Dihili were so alien in their thinking that having Tercel privy to his thoughts was no more embarrassing than sharing them with his owl, Kuari. Certainly he had linked minds so often with Tercel that he never really bothered to shield against him. By this time he was so used to sharing his thoughts with Dihili that it came as second nature, as natural as breathing. Because it wouldn't be true, he suggested. I've been growing, you know. I'm not the skinny little brat you used to carry around like a leaf. I'm almost a match for snowfire now. Tercel tossed his head with amusement, down, not up, or he'd have impaled Darion on a horn. Almost, indeed. You may be his match in height, but not in muscle, youngster, and you by no means weigh as much as he does. But you are right. It would not be the entire truth. What is the duty of the king's stag? To drive the herd from danger, to take the rear and guard, to stand and fight enemies off, Darion replied promptly. You are one of the stronger mind-speakers. You are light, and you are a fighter. You and I have linked minds many times in battle. If danger comes on us, you are the most comfortable with me, and you are the best combination of skills to pair with mine to keep your herd and mine safe. Tercel's logic was, as usual, impeccable. Darion could combine his mental strength with Tercel's to overcome panic in the herd. He was a match for any bowman in the group but Snowfire, so playing rear guard was a logical choice for him, and he and Tercel had proved more than once in close combat that their skills added together made them formidable foes. Darion was still flattered and pleased, because the same could have been said of some of the others, too. Your mind touch is unobtrusive, and when you are thinking, your mind voice is pleasant to listen to, Tercel added. The others sometimes babble most annoyingly, or obsess over trifles. You only obsess over things of importance. That pleased him, too. He took a certain pride in being able to think well. It was a skill Justin had tried to teach him, and he wanted his abilities to reflect well on his old teacher. In spite of the fact that I didn't value him while I had him, but that was a thought and a shame he kept to himself under shield. It was his grief and his alone to expiate. By now, Kuari must have circled on both sides of our back trail. He sent a wordless, soft touch back to his bond bird, who responded immediately. Anything? he asked. Dear, quiet, go from grass to water, was the reply. Darion was glad to hear that. Anything on the back trail would have spooked the entire herd, so evidently his group had crossed the deer's game trail at the time when they were moving purely by coincidence. But there was someone else who'd like to know about a herd of deer behind them. Stay with the herd, Kuari. You'll have company in a bit. He cast his thoughts upward, changing the feel of his mind sending to that of another friend. Kel, Kuari's got deer in sight, on our back trail. He got an instant response. The young griffin was in a growth spurt, and always hungry. Deer, Kelvrin exulted. Oh, yes. That was all he got, as Kelvrin sent his thoughts winging after the owls. Kelvrin was up ahead of them, and higher in the tree canopy than Kuari. If there was any skill that Kelvrin had gained above and beyond any other griffin, it was the ability to move through the high branches of the great trees with barely a wing beat. In a moment, though, he would be winging back above the canopy until he came up with Kuari. 
Then, using the owl's information, he'd dive blind through the screen of foliage, just like a goshawk going for a rabbit in the brush. And with any luck, he'd get a deer before the deer knew he was there. Otherwise, he'd be in for a tail chase. Kell could catch a deer in a tail chase. It just wasn't his favorite form of pursuit. Though the injuries that often resulted from tail chases gave him plenty of extra attention, he'd much rather make a clean kill and a quick one. Chases were a waste of energy. Faintly from behind him came the noise of something large crashing through the branches and Kuari's excited hoots. Kuari loved watching Kell hunt. All bond birds were far more social than their raptor ancestors, and took pleasure in each other's company and successes. Breeding that trait into them had been imperative, since without it, Kuari would have happily made a meal off of any of the other birds in the company. Kuari's talons could easily pierce a cow's skull. He'd make short work of another bird. Two, two. Kuari projected excitedly into Darion's mind. He got two, two. Tercel chimed in, impressed. By the horns of the moon, though, that's amazing. If Kelvrin had managed to kill two deer at once, there was no point in letting them go to waste. Snowfire, he called ahead. I sent Kell on the back trail after a deer, and it seems he's gotten two instead of one. Snowfire turned, stared at him to see if he was serious, then broke into astonished laughter. I had no idea he was that hungry. He called ahead to the rest of the team. Winter sky, rain dance. Peel off and go back until you find Kell. He's made a kill too big for him to carry. A short time later, two of the team rode past Darion with a wave. Their mounts at a brisk trot, two riderless does from the herd trotting beside them, while Kelvrin stood guard, and their own birds circled above as extra protection. They'd field dress the two deer, strap each to a rough travois, then rejoin the rest. To make it easier for them to catch up, Snowfire slowed the team to an amble. This wasn't the first time that Kell had made kills too large to eat at once or carry, but it was the first time he'd made a double kill. Nightwind is going to be very proud of him. Darion thought warmly, "He's going to be just as proud of himself." Griffins, after all, were praise-driven, and what they didn't receive from others, they often enough filled in for themselves. Roughly a candle mark later, Rain Dance and Winter Sky came trotting back. The riderless Daihili now each dragging a travois with the somewhat mangled carcass of a fine young buck strapped on it. That would slow them all down, of course, but it wasn't that long until they were going to make camp. So the prospect of fresh meat would more than make up for it. Kell would dine tonight on one deer. The team would have part of the other. Then Kell would get the remains for his breakfast. It took a lot of meat to feed a griffin, though fortunately he usually managed to supply it himself. In lean times, breads were used to supplement the meat, mostly to provide mass. And luckily for everyone who would have had to hear his complaining, Kelvin had acquired a taste for bread anyway. Hungry griffins were grouchy griffins. There were no more breaks in the routine of travel until the light beneath the trees had begun to redden and grow dimmer, a sure sign that the sun was about to set. By then, the advance scouts had found a suitable camping spot, and those with lighter burdens and the unburdened Daihili had gone on ahead to prepare the camp, leaving the rest to come in at their own pace. That, or so Darion thought, was one of the advantages of being the rear guard. By the time he reached camp, it was a camp. 
The tents were all set up, a latrine pit had been dug, water fetched, and Aishin, the chief Hertasi, had everything ready to make dinner for the entire team. Since the job of rear guard was to make a circuit of the camp before coming in himself, the rear guard never had to do any of the camp chores. Some nights, in the winter, for instance, when he was frozen from his nose to his toes, or in the pouring rain, that was a hardship. Being the one who had to make certain that all the territory within their perimeter was clear under those circumstances, with dinner scents on the breeze, was assuredly a hardship. Not tonight, though. He dismounted and let Tercel go on into camp, to put himself into the capable hands of the Herr Tassi to have his minimal tack removed. No Daihili would ever subject himself to the indignity of a bit and bridle. However, they did allow a modified hackamore, similar to that worn by companions, and a saddle pad to cover their protruding backbones. As Darion knew from painful personal experience, riding a Daihili without that saddle pad was much like sliding naked down a cliff, but not nearly as comfortable. He and Kuari made the circuit of the camp without incident, marking good places for sentries with something unobtrusive, natural, but unmistakable to any of the Taledras, feathers, usually wedged into the bark of a tree. When he got back into camp, the first set of sentries had eaten a light snack and were ready to go out. They'd get a second meal when they came back in, but no Taledras would stand sentry with a full stomach. It was too easy to doze off. Aishin had his dinner ready and waiting for him, a savory butterflied venison steak and journey bread, with some mixed, unidentified shoots and greens. Aishin and the other Herr Tassi knew the forest and what it could provide as well as they knew the patterns of their own scales. They foraged as the team traveled every day, and Darion never knew what they would come up with. They always had something green and growing in addition to meat and bread, even in the dead of winter, for Aishin took great care with the diet and health of his charges. Darion knew better than to leave so much as a scrap of that green stuff on his plate, too. Aishin would show no mercy to anyone who didn't eat what was given him. Darion sat down to eat in the blue dusk beneath the trees. He polished off the last scrap in full dark. He was the last to eat, and brought Aishin his empty plate just as the Hertasi cleaned the last of the pans. We are not far from the Vale now, Aishin told him with a toothy grin. One day, two at the most, then you will see. Nothing we passed through in Valdemar compares. Nothing we passed through in Valdemar was bigger than two or three villages put together, Darion reminded him. We were not exactly traversing through the height of Valdemaran civilization, you know. Oh, indeed, Aishin chuckled. You will see. Darion laughed and slapped the little lizard creature on the back. I'm certain that I will, he agreed. But for tonight, all I want to see is my bed. He wouldn't have thought, back when he was Justin's apprentice, that simply riding all day long would be tiring. After all, it was your mount that did most of the work, right? Well, that turned out to be only partially true. Riding was more work than Darion would have imagined four years ago. Riding literally from dawn until dusk was enough to tire anyone out. Riding as tail guard was exhausting mentally as well as physically. So he wasn't joking when he told Aishin that all he wanted to see was his bed. He continued to share a tent with young winter sky. It was a tent made for three, but only the two of them used it now. Snowfire had long since made his union with Nightwind a formal one, which just gave Wintersky and Darion more room. 
Winter Sky sat beside a small campfire in front of their tent, contentedly toasting a stick. Darion sat down beside his friend and took another dry twig, breaking it into tiny bits and casting each bit into the heart of the fire. Aishan says we'll be at the Vale in the next day or two, he said, and Winter Sky nodded. Probably late tomorrow, he replied. Everybody's pretty anxious to get home. My guess is that they'll roust us out before dawn and tell us to eat in the saddle. Which is why you're roasting a stick to calm down so you can get to sleep quickly, Darion finished for him and yawned. Believe me, I don't need that to get me to sleep. Then he snickered. Poor Snowfire, he and Nightwind won't get much chance to cuddle tonight. Winter Sky snorted and elbowed him. Darion elbowed right back, and both made moon-calf faces at each other so that they both broke into peals of laughter. As the two youngest members of the team, they spent a great deal of time together, got into a certain amount of mischief together, and despite coming from such different cultures, had far more in common than Darion had found with the boys his age in Erald's Grove. Darion really felt by now that he was part of a family, with Winter Sky, the brother he had always wanted. They chortled themselves breathless, paying no attention to the quizzical looks of some of the other Hawk brothers. Winter Sky tossed his stick into the fire, Darion followed it with the remains of his, and they both went straight to bed. Winter Sky's bird was already asleep on his perch inside the tent, Kuari dozed in the branches of the tree above them. Although most owls were nocturnal, the eagle owls were comfortable in darkness or daylight. Their size gave them a hunting advantage in the daytime, and their night sight and silent flight the advantage after dark. Kuari could adapt his sleep schedule to suit his bondmate. As Winter Sky had predicted, Hertasi rousted them out while it was still as dark as the inside of a cold drake's belly in an ice cave. They weren't given a lot of time to ready themselves either. Hertasi were efficient under any conditions, but Darion had never seen them work quite so quickly before. The camp was down and packed up by the time he had Tercel saddled, and Aishan must have known last night that this was going to happen because one of his helpers came by with pastry-wrapped venison that Aishan must have put to baking in the embers of the cook fire the night before. Darion actually got to eat his without being in the saddle. No one had told him he had a new assignment, so he was tail guard again this morning. Tail Guard's morning duty was to make sure the camp was clear, that all the fires were out, that nothing had been left behind. So he ate his meat roll and drank his bittersweet hot kava, while everyone else bustled about, getting their riding order straight, then started the day's trek, still in the dark. Darion was entirely unsurprised to see that Snowfire had lead duty— with not one, but two owls as bond birds, he was the only logical choice for a ride in total darkness. As soon as the last Daiheli cleared the camp, Darion summoned up a mage light and made a thorough inspection of the site. This time he uncovered evidence of the hasty departure in the form of a couple of misplaced small articles of clothing and adornment, a bit of trash that needed burial, and one fire that had not been thoroughly extinguished and still smoked. These small tasks attended to, he mounted Tercel, and with Kuari following in the trees, he caught up with the rest. He banished the light as soon as he drew up with the rearmost rider, Sunleaf, whose forest gyre dozed on a perch incorporated into the saddle bow in front of him. Riding in the darkness like this, the team now depended on the eyes and ears of only three birds and Kelvrin to protect them. 
Even day storms flock of crows rode, two on the saddle bow perch, two on the horns of her dihele pyrene, and the rest on the horns of any other dihele that would let them. With nothing to look at but the vaguest of shadows, Darion was acutely aware of every calling insect, every time a bird chirped or squawked its sleepy protest at being disturbed, every crackle of dead leaf or rustle of undergrowth. None of this made him at all wary or nervous. He'd grown up in forest like this, and these were all normal night sounds— He'd be alerted only if they stopped, or if a sudden burst of noise betrayed that something had disturbed the sylvan sleepers. Kuari was perfectly composed, and perfectly full. He'd eaten well last night, and would not need to eat again until tonight. He wasn't tempted to hunt, not even by the flocks of drowsy birds he passed beneath. What Kuari saw danced like a ghost image in front of Darion's eyes, a double vision that did not disconcert him in the least now, though it had taken him months to get used to it. The air was very still, not a breath of breeze. It was cold and smelled of damp old leaves and fog. It felt heavy somehow. Morning before dawn almost always felt like that, as if it was just possible that the sun might not rise after all. It was difficult to judge the passing of time. Kuari would rise above the treetops once in a while to take the measure of the dawn, and for what seemed to be the longest time he saw nothing but darkness and stars— Finally, though, the strange sense of heaviness lifted ever so slightly. Kuari lofted through the leaves to catch the first brightening in the east, and the first tentative notes of the bird's dawn chorus drifted down to the travelers below. Sunleaf's forest gyre roused all his feathers with a quick shake, still more heard than seen, as those first notes brought him out of his doze. Gradually, faint light filtered down through the trees. At first the light was so very faint that everything seemed painted in shades of black and gray, but as the sun rose the light brightened to a thin, dusty rose, and color came back into the world. Up and down the line of riders, birds were shaking out their feathers, stretching their wings, preening and yawning. Then, one by one, they hopped onto their bondmates' gauntleted arms to be tossed into the air. The crows were the first, and taunted the others as lazy loafers with their derisive cause as they rode up into the canopy. Stung by the good-natured insult, the younger birds followed immediately— the older birds were too seasoned to be tempted into flight by a pack of delinquents before they'd warmed up their muscles. There was plenty of stretching and flapping before the rest took to the air. Two enormous shapes lofted silently toward the line beneath the lowest branches, one from ahead and to the right, one from the left. These were Wheel and Her, Snowfire's bond birds, that meant that Snowfire had dropped back and someone else with a fresher bird had taken over the forward position. There were three Dihele in the herd with peculiar saddles, more of a perch than a saddle, and no reins. These were for Wheel and Her and sometimes Kuari, who were all far too large to sit a perch in front of anyone. It was all Darion could do to carry Kuari on his shoulder or give him a short and temporary ride on his gauntleted arm. The eagle owls were big and awfully heavy. On Snowfire's advice, Darion had built up his arms and shoulders with a great deal of lifting and carrying and wood chopping in order to be able to support the weight of his friend. It's just a good thing that nobody with us has real eagles as a bond bird, Darion thought, as he watched the eagle owls disappear somewhere up ahead, presumably making a landing on their mounts. 
Snowfire had once told him that the only person in Kevala to have a true eagle and not a hawk eagle as a bond bird was the blacksmith. All bond birds were easily twice, even three times the mass of their wild counterparts. Darion could hardly imagine how large a true bond bird eagle must be. The morning passed uneventfully, and so did the afternoon, except that the break for lunch was hardly more than a pause, while more pastry rolls were passed out to the riders and nose bags of grain to the Daihili. They all ate on the move, something that until now had been done only during wretchedly cold weather to enable the team to get to shelter faster. It was late in the afternoon that the biggest bird Darion had ever seen in his life swooped down out of the trees and screamed a greeting as it passed over the heads of everyone in the team. The wingspan alone was so wide not even her could match it, more than the height of a mounted man, easily. All the bond birds set up a deafening chorus of replies, converging on the riders from every direction and taking to their perches to go into full wing-spread display. The huge raptor that had triggered the cacophony made another pass over the heads of the team, this time flying from the rear to the frontmost rider, then disappearing into the branches again. Derion, you can stand down. The mind voice was Snowfire's. No point in trying to shout. He wouldn't be heard. Remember the eagle I told you about that's bonded to a blacksmith? That's her. We're under Kevala guard now. You can relax. Darion took a deep breath and let it out in a low whistle. The birds were finally quieting down and settling. So that's a bond bird eagle? If I were Daihili, I think I'd make her walk. As dusk fell, there was a distant glow through the trees ahead of them, and just as the last light of day faded from beneath the trees, the next lot of escorts met them. This was a veritable stampede of Daihili, first an avalanche of young stags and does, then followed by the older does and their fawns, with five king stags bringing up the rear. They poured around the line of riders, the youngsters frolicking, the older Daihili trotting up to rub noses with friends, and the king stags making straight for Tercel. Judging by all the vigorous head-nodding going on, the king stags went into an immediate six-way conference, one which would probably last for several days. After all, Tercel was an ambassador to Valdemar in his own right, one looking for new grazing lands for Daihili, and he had negotiated his own set of treaties with various Valdemaran populations through the medium of different heralds. Unburdened Daihili separated from the group and joined the massed herds, who all cleared off, heading back to the Vale. That left room for the next lot of greeters, a flood of Hertasi. They seemed to appear out of nowhere, as Hertasi were wont to do. There were probably a few hundred of them, but it seemed as if there were a couple of thousand at the least— when they had finished swarming the team and disappeared back into the darkness, there was not a single scrap of baggage left anywhere in the line, for they had stripped it from every burdened Daihili, leaving them free to run ahead as well. Then came the first of the wonders that would leave Darion breathless for most of the evening. Lights approached the line of riders, lights bounding along just below the level of the first branches. As the many-colored lights neared, Darion identified them as mage lights, but they were carried, or rather pulled along, by bond birds. Mage lights weighed nothing, of course, but how wonderful to see the bond birds, each trailing a different colored sphere in its wake. The birds with the team again set up their greeting display, and the birds from the Vale remained with the team lighting their way home, perched overhead in the lowest branches. 
As Darion passed the birds at the rear, they flew ahead to the front of the team and took up new perches. Then, as the light ahead grew stronger and stronger, they came to the entrance to the veil itself, and the crowd of friends and relations waiting there for them. A cheer went up as the long absent team broke through the cover of the forest. Now, for the first time, Darion saw Hawk Brothers in all their festal glory, and he was, to put it mildly, dazzled. No one on the team had brought any sort of fancy garments with them, though Hawk Brother clothing had been exotic enough to Darion's eyes, so he'd had no idea what he was going to see. No wonder Aishan had warned him that he'd be surprised. Men and women alike dressed in spectacular costumes. What one wore seemed to be more a reflection of his or her personality than gender. Long, pale hair was beaded, braided, feathered, dyed, and cut in the most amazing styles. They didn't look real, somehow, yet they surged forward like any group of folk meeting with people they'd been parted from for too long. But, of course, no one came forward to greet him. Now, for the first time in years, Darion felt very much the outsider and painfully alone. A young Hertasi skittered up and took his bridle, looking up at him expectantly. Tercel lifted his head up, and the small Hertasi was lifted off the ground for a moment, squawking at first, then emitting a long burble of laughter as he was lowered back down. Older Hertasi appeared on each side, sharing the laughter. He dismounted from Tercel's saddle and let the Hertasi strip his friend of tack and carry it off. Then Tercel himself stepped away, leaving him even more alone with all of the meetings and greetings swirling around him. Derion, Snowfire pushed his way through the crowd with an older man and woman in tow, his face alight. Here, mother, father, this is Derion Firkin, Kevaldemar. Derion, this lady is my mother, Dawn Mist, and this is my father, Heartwood, he grinned, yours also. The two Taledras smiled warmly, and each held out a hand. Darion took them, tentatively at first, then with the dizzying sensation that he was settling into something real and solid and welcoming. His loneliness evaporated, and with a wonder-filled grin, he entered Kevala Vale with the rest of the Taledras. From the moment that Darion passed through the impressive, vine-covered entrance to Kevala Vale to the moment that he fell asleep, he was half afraid to blink lest he miss some new wonder. Now he knew why Aishan had been so smug. Just past the faintly visible barrier that protected the Vale from outside weather, he stepped into an entirely new realm. The barrier distorted some of what lay beyond it and cloaked the rest so that from the outside it appeared that there was nothing beyond it except more ordinary forest. But when he passed through it, feeling a faint tingle as he did so, he saw what it had concealed. Before him lay a softly curving path that wound deep into an exotic garden within only a few paces from the entrance. But it was not at all dark, for light glimmered and gleamed through the foliage. He followed the path to its first turning. Mage lights were supplemented by fantastic lanterns in glowing colors, round, square, oblong, in the shapes of flowers and leaves, stars and the phases of the moon. The lanterns hung from decorated poles crafted of carved wood on either side of the pathway. Some of these poles were carved with vines twining about them, some in the shapes of fantastic animals and birds, some decorated with geometric shapes or abstract curved lines. 
the path itself, paved in tiny pebbles of river gravel, was bordered in larger, water-smoothed rocks and was intersected at frequent intervals by a tiny sparkling stream that danced and laughed over similar stones. Where the path crossed these streams, it led over charmingly carved bridges, no two alike. The stream wasn't so wide that the bridges were needed. They were simply there because they were attractive. Unlike the forest outside, where undergrowth was sparse, here plants, bushes, and even smaller trees throve to the point of luxury— Blossoming vines formed screens and curtains. Flowering bushes poured scent onto the breeze. More flowers, closed now in the fragrant half-light along the path, gave promise that day would bring even more beauty. It was noticeably warmer here, the same gentle warmth of a summer night rather than the cool of a spring evening. Frogs and crickets sang in little pockets of shadow, and overhead nightingales poured out melody into the darkness above the lanterns. But that was only the beginning of the wonders. As Darion followed Snowfire and his parents deeper into the vale, other sounds overhead made him look into the branches of the huge trees— it was at that point that he realized that the trees were even bigger than the ones outside the vale, and that they held dwellings, cradled in their huge boughs. The branches were as big as the trunks of the trees that he was used to. So high up were these living places that at first he had taken them for more elaborate lanterns. So these were the famous Ekele of the Hawk Brothers— Darion marveled at the highly individual nests resting above. Once again, so far as he could tell, no two were alike. Some showed lights and movement, some were dark, and lights twinkling further up the trunks suggested that there were still more of these ekele higher up. The mere thought of how high they must be made him dizzy. Staircases spiraled up the trunks, showing how the Hawk brothers gained access to their homes, and the staircases were just as ornamental as anything else Darion had seen so far. No wonder everyone is in such good shape. They have to be, just to go to and from their homes. We've been in this vale for a very long time, Darion, Snowfire said over his shoulder. "'Longer, I think, than any other clan has been in one place. Three, four generations at least, I think, "'and our people are very long-lived. "'It's more than enough time to really make this vale into a work of art, "'a place none of us wants to leave.' "'I can certainly see why,' Darion replied, dazed. That was when they passed the last screening of vine and came out into the open. This was clearly the center of the veil. There stood the heartstone, right in the middle. It was a tall, smooth spire of natural rock, something like an enormous stalagmite, and of the same creamy alabaster color and texture. It glowed warmly welcomingly, as if it too was a kind of lantern. Stepped, fitted stones partially encircled it and kept it clean of debris. It also glowed and pulsed to his mage sight, so brightly that he had to block that part of his abilities. About three years ago, we finally got enough power coming into the heartstone to put up the veil again. Snowfire's father said with satisfaction as they all paused for a moment at the edge of the clearing. There's still not enough to power nearly as much as we used to do, but we're the first clan to get their veil up. Not nearly as much. I almost hate to think what they used to do was all Darion could think, as the heartstone seemed to pulse in time with his heart with all the power it held. It was magnificent, awful, in the strictest sense of the term. 
He had never in all of his life seen that kind of power before, and he rather doubted that he would ever see its like again, certainly not in his own little veil. It would probably take generations before his own heartstone ever accumulated this level of power. Snowfire sighed, lifting his face to the heartstone as one starved of light would raise his face to the sun. Oh, it is so good to be back within the reach of a heartstone again. For a very long time, Darion simply couldn't look away from the wonder, though he did not make the mistake of using his mage sight again. When he finally did look away, it was with the realization that this was what his team had been trying to reproduce in a crude form in every long-term camp they'd made. Here was the source of the little stream they'd followed, and now it was clear that many more little streams took their water from here to run through other parts of the vale. To his right lay a spring-fed series of cascades that in turn led into a cool, clear pond with colorful fish drifting just beneath the surface— a multitude of water lilies and other water plants throve there, and a series of steps cut into the side showed that more than just the fish were wont to swim there. Next to this was an herb garden, as ordered and mathematical in its layout as the rest of the vale was not, though there wasn't a straight line to be seen there. It lay in the quarter of this clear area directly in front of Darion, as the pond was in the quarter to his left. He had overlooked it at first in gazing at the hearthstone directly beyond it, perhaps because it was so... ordinary. It looked exactly like every other large herb garden he'd seen over the course of their travels in the courtyards of all of the larger temples and healers' enclaves. Neatly laid out, in a curving maze, every herb had its own little patch, each patch's growth trimmed off in edges as straight as a rule. Nothing grew taller than his waist, most growth lay between his ankle and knee. To his right was a cluster of low buildings, beautifully integrated with the landscape to the point that they even had hanging plants and flowers growing on their flat roofs. At first glance he had taken them for an unusually regular stone formation, in fact. The hot spring and the main soaking and bathing pools are on the other side of the hearthstone, Snowfire told him, and I don't know about you, but after today's ride, that's the first place I want to go. The mere thought of relaxing in a hot pool made his aching limbs all declare in favor of the idea, so he just nodded and followed Snowfire and his parents around the fascinating heartstone and past a screening of tall, jointed plants with stalks as thick as his calf and graceful leaves that formed a solid wall hiding all beyond them. Once past that screen, a complex of interconnected pools on multiple levels stretched out in front of them, some so small they could only hold two or three people at once, some big enough to hold the entire team, Hertasi included. It looked, from the amount of steam rising from the water, that the hottest pools were on the highest level, the coolest on the bottom— it also appeared that everyone in the team had the same idea as Snowfire, for they were all up to their chins in hot water, this time actual instead of metaphorical. Nightwind waved at them from a middle level, her hair piled high on her head and held there with wooden skewers, her face flushed and damp from the heat. Snowfire waved back at her and climbed the rocks to join her, but Darion had already picked out which of the pools was hottest and headed straight for it, forgetting everything but how good that water would feel. Of course, after being with Taledras for four years, he shed his clothing at the edge of the pool as a matter of course and eased himself down into it, knowing that Herr Tassi would gather up the clothing and that towels and replacements would materialize when he needed them. 
The water was just as hot as he'd hoped it was, too hot to stay in for long, which was probably why he had this small pool to himself. But it was just what his aching muscles wanted. The polished, sculptured sides of the pool formed seats of varying heights. He shifted around until he found one that allowed him to lean back with just his head above the water and relaxed into the smooth stone, eyes closed, until even he could no longer take the heat. He didn't want to leave just yet, though. There were still aches that hadn't been soaked out. So instead of abandoning the pools altogether, he moved down to another not so warm. In fact, in contrast to the one he'd just left, this one felt positively tepid. He remained there until it too felt too warm, then moved again, joining Night Wind and Snowfire and several more of the team and some strangers in a community soak. The others were involved in a rambling conversation that seemed to consist of trading stories of what had gone on in the Vale in the team's absence for stories of what the team had done. Darion simply slid into an unoccupied seat and listened, adding a word or two if he was spoken to directly, but otherwise just listening. But finally, one of the strangers turned to him. What think you of all this, new wing brother? The young woman asked him, her eyes sparkling impishly. He shrugged at a loss for words. Amazing. Just amazing. Well, another girl drawled lazily, there are things in other lands that equal or surpass a veil, but on the whole, this is a fine place to live. So says a former dweller in White Griffin, laughed the first, high praise indeed. So this was another of Nightwind's people, a Kaledain. Darion wanted to ask a hundred questions, but felt too shy and tongue-tied to voice any of them. The first girl saved him from having to make any conversation. If you are hungry, Darion, and I think you must be, since the rest of your team ate like famished wolves when Hertasi brought them food, there will be more provender over yonder, in the building nearest us. She pointed with her chin at the group of buildings. There always is. We often must keep irregular hours, so the Hertasi keep foods out that do not readily spoil or suffer growing cold or warm. Thank you, he said shyly, relieved that he would not have to ask what he should do about the hunger beast awakening in his belly, but she was not quite finished. You will also find sleeping places there for those who are not used to Ekele or who have not built one of their own, she continued. Those are our guest houses. Simply look until you find one that no one has taken and make it yours. The Hertasi will bring your things there. Grateful that he would not have to interrupt Snowfire and act like a very little brother indeed, he blushed and thanked her again. She giggled, as did the other girl. It was the Kaledain who spoke next, poking her friend with her elbow. Snowfire's messages home about the barbarians and his new wing brother were so fulsome and interesting that Summerdance here wanted to meet you as soon as you all returned, said the Kaledain wickedly, so she thought she could manage to casually be your guide to the Vale. That was too much for Summer Dance, who whirled, seized her friend's head in both hands, and shoved her under the water. Her friend came up spluttering, but mostly with laughter. Summer Dance turned to Darion with a flushed face, and he thought quickly, hoping to find a way to salvage the situation. Simple gratitude and politeness seemed the most effective and direct approach. That was very kind of you, to think of how a stranger might be so confused here, Summer Dance, he told her. 
especially as I am certain you have many tasks of your own to tend to, and it could be irritating to find yourself saddled with an idiot. Oh, but I already am, Summer Dance replied sweetly, staring pointedly at her friend. And in contrast to poor, defective Nightbird here, why, even the most imbecilic strat... She didn't get to finish the statement, for Nightbird returned the favor by dunking her. As Summer Dance came up gasping for air, the situation might have escalated had not a silver-haired elder called out lazily, Enough, my children, you know the rules. Take your romping to the swimming pools and the waterfall. If you wish to remain here, save your revenge for later. That quelled both of them for the moment, though their merry eyes boded mischief to come. Summer Dance managed to conquer her blushes, and Darion politely pretended that she had never been embarrassed. So those buildings there are for guests, he asked. I had the impression that Taledras didn't particularly encourage guests, yet you have many of those buildings. Well, we've kept to ourselves, but times do change, you know, and we are not going to lag behind them. Summer Dance replied as she pulled her soaked hair out of her eyes and began braiding it back with Nightbird's help. The truth of it is that we, Kaledain, descended on them six years ago, and they had to build us guest houses, Nightbird added. Since then, most of us have either made our own dwellings or moved in with congenial taledras, so the guest quarters are open again. She tied the braid she was working on with a bit of cord. There, reasonably tidy. And the rest of the truth is that now we have no need to discourage visitors. So when there are those brave enough to dare the fearsome Hawk Brothers in their lair, Summer Dance bared her teeth in a mock snarl and crooked both hands into claws. We reward them by giving them a decent bed. It's only fair, Nightbird finished, getting in the last word. Darion looked from one girl to the other and back again. Are you sure you aren't sisters? he finally said. You certainly sound like it. Both girls dissolved in laughter, which spread to the half of the occupants of the pool who'd chanced to overhear the remark. So we have been telling them since Nightbird arrived, youngling, the elder said, still chuckling. I'd be wary of them if I were you. Where these two tread, trouble follows. Us? Nightbird cried indignantly. Never, Summer Dance declared. We're harmless, innocent, absolutely. The elder rolled his eyes, but said only in the driest voice imaginable, Indeed. Summer Dance looked stricken, but father... Save it for one who did not see you born, when you came into the world with mischief grasped in both hands, the elder interrupted, closing his eyes and leaning back into the embrace of the hot water. Now, let a poor old man soak his bones in peace. Nightbird snatched at a towel and stood up. Come on, friends, no one appreciates us here. Let's just get dressed and show Darion around a little. Summer Dance was not at all reluctant, so Darion found himself shortly clothed in the loose-fitting, cool garments that the Hawk Brothers favored for lounging, with each arm being held by an extremely attractive young lady as he was steered toward the guest houses. Have you actually got weather in the veil? he asked curiously, seeing that the strangely built houses had proper roofs under all their foliage. Controlled weather, Summer Dance said proudly, though before we had enough power back to put the veil up, we had regular weather in here for a while. All we really do is keep things warm, 
If it rains out there, it rains in here. If it snows out there, it rains in here. Why keep rain out? Nightbird continued from the other side. The plants still need it, and besides, most of us like rain, as long as it's warm. And in the summer, we never let it get too warm in here, Summer Dance added. No droughts either, though we try not to let any droughts happen outside, with trees the size of the ones in the Pelagiris, an uncontrolled forest fire would not bear thinking about. We arrange for controlled fires, of course, to keep the forest healthy, but the forest has to be well watered before we dare do that. That's why, when we were doing without, we gave up the veil so that we could keep doing weather magic. Darion nodded with a shiver. He and the team had helped to fight a forest fire, the first he'd ever seen, and Summer Dance was right. A forest fire loose among the great trees of the Pelagiris would be nothing short of a holocaust. There were no doors on these buildings, only a living screen of leafy vine, which Summer Dance parted so they could all walk inside the first building of the group. The walls were half structure, half artwork. Windows of colored glass gave way to carved panels of wood, which in turn gave place to living walls of braided tree trunks and vines, all of it lit by lanterns rather than mage lights. There, as promised, was a table spread with simple foodstuffs, breads, fruit, cheeses. They all helped themselves and poured drinks from covered pitchers of cool juices, then took their loot to a grouping of several fat cushions on the floor. There were proper chairs and tables, more groupings of cushions, and even a couch or two, but the girls clearly preferred to sprawl on cushions. In between mouthfuls, they told him about the veil, saving him from having to make any conversation at all. He made interested sounds from time to time, but otherwise kept his mouth full and closed. He heard more than he could store away in his memory about the veil itself, who was partnering with whom, who was quarreling with whom, who had designs on whom, what projects were going, stalled, stupid, or planned. In short, it sounded exactly like a village, with all the village gossip, only with much better scenery and clothing. Even the strangest people have familiar habits, he thought wryly, and let them chatter on until he was comfortably full. Then he sat up a little straighter and began to insert some questions of his own. Where did the Daihili go, he asked first, for he hadn't seen a single one since they'd all disappeared with the massed herds. They all vanished together when we got here. They have their own big meadow at the far end of the vale, farthest from the entrance, Summer Dance told him. I've got my ekele in a tree on the edge of the meadow. And Kelvrin? Where's he? With the rest of the griffins in the cliffs above the vale. That's where I live. That was Nightbird, of course. And suddenly something clicked in Darion's mind. "'Your Nightwind's sister!' he exclaimed. "'The Trondiern apprentice. "'That's why you got letters from Snowfire.' "'For some reason that revelation seemed excruciatingly funny to both girls "'as they burst into laughter again. "'I told you he'd figure it out all by himself,' Nightbird chortled. "'Well, I never said I doubted you,' Summer Dance retorted. Darion turned to her and stared at her in thought for a moment. You can't be Snowfire's sister because he's an only child. Are you a cousin? She mimed, shooting an arrow. Dead in the black. Oh, it is so nice to know that Snowfire wasn't exaggerating how smart you were. Not bad. Not bad at deduction at all. Not that most people in the Vale aren't related in some way or another, Nightbird pointed out, but they're very near cousins. 
Dawn Mist's brother and Hart Wood's sister are her mother and father, so she's what we call a double cousin. I hope that's not too confusing. Not at all. Remember, I come from a little village, and practically everyone there is related to everyone else in some way. Darion smiled. I think I can keep it all straight. Now it was their turn to ask about Erold's Grove, and his tiny, prosaic little village was at least moderately interesting for them. But what they really enjoyed was hearing about Valdemar in general. Some things he had to answer truthfully with the preface of, "I've never seen this myself, but I've been told that." They seemed utterly amazed that people could live without any magic at all for hundreds of years, and were just as fascinated to hear what had taken the place of that magic. I feel sorry for people who have to live without weather control. Summerdance sighed as he described a four-day blizzard he and the team had endured. Even though we had it, for a while we had to save the energy for things that were really important, and it was horrible. It was worse being in the Vale without weather protection. I don't ever want to see snow on my Ekele steps again. I know how you feel," Nightbird agreed. "I thought I would never get warm the whole winter. People are used to it," he pointed out. Not having seasons would seem strange to them, and there's some enjoyment in it. Erold's Grove used to have a winter fair with all sorts of special snow and ice games and sports, and I met some people who really love the snow. They'd be horrified if they had to do without it. There's something to be said for a good rousing thunderstorm. Nightbird agreed. Especially when you're snug inside, maybe summer dance sounded doubtful. I still draw the line at snow, though. Darion yawned, covering his mouth hastily with his hand. But summer dance was instantly all contrition. Oh, bother! Here we've kept you up, nattering at you, and you're probably perishing to get some sleep. She exclaimed. Look, just what kind of quarters do you like anyway? Dark, he said promptly. No hammocks. I still haven't gotten used to sleeping in anything that moves, but mostly as dark as possible. One thing I don't suffer from is fear of being shut in. Summer dance glanced at Nightbird, who nodded. I think I know just the place," she said, "and no one's taken it since the Kaledain Hertasi all dug their own burrows. Follow me," he did. She led him through the building complex. They were all linked together, apparently, to a long, low-ceilinged structure made up entirely of cozy, rounded sets of rooms. There wasn't a straight line to be seen, and as Nightbird had promised, none of them showed any signs of occupation. These give most Hook brothers the shivers, Nightbird told him, as Summer Dance lingered just outside the complex. Doesn't bother me. White Griffin is full of lairs and dens like this, and the Hertasi and Kyrie prefer them. This place is actually dug right under the hill, so it'll be quiet enough. It's not what I'd choose to live in permanently, but right now, this is perfect. Darion told her with satisfaction. I could sleep for a week in here. Again, a huge yawn caught him quite off guard. Excuse me, and from the way I feel, I probably will sleep for a week. Do you know they got us up and in the saddle way before dawn, and we didn't stop even to eat. I've done harder riding on this trip, but nothing that was longer. Better not sleep for a week, though, or you'll miss the celebration. Nightbird warned him, and then waved her hand in a shooing motion at him. Go pick out a set of rooms, then, and I'll tell the Khertasi where you are. Rest well, Darion. And to you, and thanks. He raised his voice a little so it would carry to the doorway. Thank you, Summer Dance. I hope I'll see you both tomorrow. 
She laughed, and so did Nightbird. It seemed to be a common response for them. Just try to avoid us, Summer Dance replied, and the two of them sauntered away, leaving him alone in the building. He picked a single room at the back of the complex. It was simply furnished. There was a low bed with clean, folded bedding waiting on it, a single lantern on the floor beside the bed, and nothing else. However, the room did have a heavy curtain he could drop down across the entrance to shut out the light. There wasn't much to shut out, just the two lanterns illuminating the corridor connecting all the rooms. He took one of the dry splinters beside the lantern and got a flame from the lantern nearest his room, then lit his own lantern so that he could see to make up his bed. By the time he'd smoothed down the last of the covers, his baggage had appeared on the floor behind him. Herr Tassi, of course. By now he was used to the way they would make things appear and disappear in complete silence, including themselves. Those abilities had proved useful in more dangerous contexts, too. Herr Tassi made wicked strike-and-run fighters, for all their small size— the packs looked shrunken. He had no doubt that they'd extracted his dirty laundry, and that by the time he woke up tomorrow, his clothing would be waiting just outside the curtain, cleaned and mended. Havens, they'll probably have put together an entire new wardrobe for me by then, he thought, climbing into bed and stifling another yawn. Aishin made more than a few remarks about that during our mission— what incredible creatures they are. Then he blew out the lantern, closed his eyes, and never felt his head touch the pillow. He woke slowly and at his own pace, which was a bit more leisurely than he'd been able to manage when he was with the team. He heard a second creature breathing in the room with him, and by the faint scent of raptor musk, knew that Kuari had found him after his bond bird's own homecoming. Mind touch told him that Kuari was deeply asleep and probably would not wake for another few candle marks, which is hardly surprising, considering how hard he worked yesterday. It wasn't the first time that Kuari had figured out where he was by mind touch, then made his way to his bondmate, walking if he had to. Kuari definitely deserved his rest, and Darion had no intention of disturbing it. What was it that the girls said about not sleeping a week, that I'd miss the celebration? He chuckled softly, as he had a pretty good notion just what that celebration was going to be about— not the homecoming. Any celebrations, for that reason, would be between and among families and friends. Although Taledras enjoyed a good festival as much as anyone, successful completion of what was essentially a fairly simple job by Hawk Brother standards would not warrant a veil-wide party. But he certainly knew what did. Starfall warned them, but they wouldn't believe him. Night wind and snowfire had given in to the inevitable two years ago and become formally mated, much to Kelvrin's delight, deciding that they would much rather have a small, intimate ceremony with the closely bonded team. Starfall, however, had warned them both that neither Snowfire's parents nor Nightwind's Kaledain kin were going to be cheated of their celebration— he had told them that it would probably signal an excuse to turn out the entire veil, and they had scoffed at the very idea, but it sounded as if Starfall was right. I bet the elders even make the two of them pledge all over again. Well, maybe this time Snowfire wouldn't be so nervous about the whole thing. He'd kept fretting that Nightwind would change her mind at the last moment. After being pledged for two years, by now... He ought to be sure of her. Darion stretched and consulted his stomach, which informed him that getting breakfast wasn't going to be an emergency. And for once, he wasn't waking up with a kink in his neck or a rock imprint in the middle of his back. 
I think I am really going to enjoy living in a veil for a while. He got up quietly, pulling back the curtain just enough so that he could see to dress. And there, next to the curtain, were two evenly stacked piles of clothing, one of his old things, neatly mended, and another of entirely new garments, such as he would never have dared wear in Erold's Grove. These were genuine Taledras garments, not the scout clothing in relatively drab colors that they'd all worn in Valdemar so as not to startle the natives or betray themselves to the monsters they were hunting. Darion loved bright colors, and always had. Given a choice, he'd have dressed as gaudily as any mountebank, so he was absolutely delighted to see the second pile of clothing waiting for him. Without hesitation, he chose a pair of loose breeches in a dark blue silk, a shirt in a lighter blue, a sash woven in blue and silver gray, and a knee-length suede vest in a shade between that of the breeches and that of the shirt. Soft, low boots of black deerskin took the place of his riding boots, and he stepped out of the guest rooms and into what he now thought of as the great room, feeling quite the hawk brother dandy. There was no one there at the moment, so he took a little food with him and went in search of starfall or snowfire, munching as he walked. He soon realized, however, that his dress was quite conservative compared with some of his Taledras kin. For one thing, he didn't have a single bit of jewelry, or so much as one feather braided into his hair, and for another, there wasn't even a thin edging of embroidery to his shirt and vest, much less the overall patterns of embroideries some of them sported. On the other hand, Maybe he wasn't quite ready for all that finery. Well, maybe just one or two feathers and a bit of trim. There were two kinds of Hertasi living in the Vale, as he well knew, the Taledras, who were mostly shy and invisible, and the Kaledain, who were mostly very visible and quite outgoing. When he finally spotted one of the latter, one not in the middle of some other task, for interrupting it would have been very rude, he asked it where Starfall and Snowfire might be found. In that amazing communication, all Hertasi shared, as if they didn't merely have mind speech, but actually shared a single mind— it told him after a moment of contemplation that Snowfire was engaged in private business, but Starfall was available, and where to find him. Many thanks, he told it, as it looked up its long snout at him, its big eyes much graver than Aishan's ever were. And please thank the others for their care of my baggage and wardrobe last night. I really didn't have anything suitable for the veil. Now the little lizard creature's eyes took on a sparkle of merriment. "'The things we brought will do for now,' it said deprecatingly. "'But when we come to know you, we will have something truly suitable for you later.' Then it trotted off. Darion knew better than to try to tell it that there was no need to go to any more trouble, because it wouldn't listen." Hertasi were like adolescent girls when it came to clothing, but with largely better taste and much better execution. Nothing made them happier than to dress humans up, as if their charges were so many oversized dolls. Their nimble fingers fairly flew through embroidery, and what was most remarkable of all, they never had to trace a pattern on the cloth beforehand— they replicated their designs or the patterns that others gave them as perfectly as the original. Perhaps giant dolls are what we are to them, in a way, he thought with amusement, and dressing us up is their hobby. I have the feeling that I'm going to be turned into a Taledras peacock, whether I'm ready for it or not, especially if there's a celebration coming. He followed the Hertasi's instructions with care, though it was all too easy to be distracted here. Every turn in the path brought something new. 
a huge tree trunk with a spiraling stair, boughs loaded with ekele, a tiny private pool, a miniature water garden complete with waterfall, lilies, and a colorful fish or two, a sculpture in stone or wood, a living sculpture in plants and flowers. It was all wonderful, and every new sight brought with it the wish that Justin could have been there to share it with him. At last he reached his goal, Starfall's Ekele, which was not in one of the huge trees that supported several in its branches, but was situated in a tree of more modest proportions and had only Starfall's dwelling in it. The base of the tree sheltered a garden planted entirely in flowers of the most subtle and delicate shades of white and the palest of pastels, with a stream and a cascade trickling through it. Starfall himself sat on a low stone bench, enjoying what was either a late breakfast or an early lunch, his falcon in the air above him playing a game of tag with a smaller bird. This was a game that Darion had seen before, especially between two very agile, swift flyers. Each bird had a streamer of paper attached to one bracelet. The object was to keep your opponent from snatching pieces of it. The bird that lost every bit of its streamer first was the one who lost the game. Starfall waved Darion over as soon as he emerged from the cover around the path. Darion walked across a lawn of grass as plush as a carpet and as thick, and joined him as Starfall's bird ripped off a bit of his opponent's streamer with an outstretched talon. "'I won't ask you what you think of our home. Your eyes said it all last night.' Starfall said, offering Darion a plate of small, savory meat pies. Darion politely took one, but only nibbled at it. I have got a question for you, though. Do you want a few days to settle in, or do you want to get to work right away? You have a great deal to learn in the way of magic, and now that we are in the Vale, it will be much easier to teach you. I'd like a few days first, sir, Darion replied, though if I'm going to have more teachers than just you, I'd like to meet them informally and talk with them a little before we start. I wouldn't, he hesitated, choosing his words with care. I wouldn't want to have anyone teaching me who didn't approve of my being here. Nor any conflicts with personality. That can be disastrous in the teaching of magic. Starfall nodded. I think that can be arranged without too much difficulty. I will not be your primary teacher. I have taught you all that I can. You'll have three temporary teachers, and I can certainly arrange for you to meet with them first. Eventually, though, you are going to need a whole new kind of teacher to match your talents, and I am afraid that you are not going to have much choice on that score. You need to learn from a healing adept, and there are not very many of those available to teach you. Healing adepts, when teaching in their own path, never take on more than one student at a time and we will have to find one who has not got a student at the moment. Darion's heart sank a little at that, but he resolved that he would manage to get along with whomever Starfall found for him, for it would be poor repayment for all that the Taledras had done for him to quarrel with the teacher they assigned him. I actually have someone in mind, Starfall went on, watching Darion closely, and I think this might be the best possible combination of student and teacher, if he's free, but I won't hear from him for a while. In that case, Darion said bravely, I hope that he is free. I trust your judgment." In the meantime, his mind buzzed with questions. Just what was a healing adept? Was he going to be an adept when he was finished with his learning? How hard was it to learn? 
Who was this person that Starfall spoke of with such caution? Wasn't he in Kevala Vale? In the meantime, Starfall went on, we will continue your lessons as best we can. One thing that you can do, even while you are settling in, is simply to observe. One day soon, certainly before the year is out, you will be returning to your new vale near your old village. What you do with it in the beginning will set the character of the place for all time. You should begin thinking now and planning now, even though many of your plans will not come to fruition in your lifetime. Darion nodded, for he had already had some thoughts along those lines. Yes, sir, he answered. Is there anything else I should do? Only that you should get to know the folk about you, and if you see a way to make yourself useful... Starfall stopped and smiled. Well, I know you, and I know that I needn't tell you that. Enjoy a bit of a holiday. I think we will resume your studies after the celebration, for if you are going to take a break before you begin, there is going to be no point in starting anything before then. Since those words were clearly a dismissal, Darion thanked him, and left him alone again. But from the twinkle in Starfall's eyes when he mentioned the celebration, it was obvious that Darion's guess was right. And just wait until Nightwind and Snowfire find out. 4. How can a ceremony be so solemn and so unrestrained at the same time, Darion wondered, though he made very certain that his thought was tightly under shield. It wouldn't do for anyone to hear him, especially not now. He'd been standing here for what seemed like half the day, though it couldn't have been even half a candle mark. As Snowfire's nearest junior male relative, he had found himself drafted for what he could only think of as a high temple ceremony, with every bit of ornamentation and trimming a notoriously ornamental people could fabricate for the occasion. He was right up in the center of the circular raised platform that had been erected yesterday in the Daihili Meadow, that being the only cleared place big enough to hold everyone. He wasn't alone, of course. He was one of the wedding party, along with Snowfire and Nightwind, three Kevala elders, Nightbird, and six independent witnesses unrelated to either of the two being joined. Now, given the length and seriousness of the ceremony and the importance everyone attached to it, the logical assumption would be that both the participants and the assembled clans watching it would be as sober as presiding judges and solemn as a herald in full formal array. Wrong. Even though the audience was quiet, so quiet Darion heard the occasional cough or shuffling of feet, they were all grinning from ear to ear, and it was obvious that they were barely repressing their exuberance long enough for the ceremony to conclude. Everyone seemed to consider the whole thing to be a grand joke at the expense of the long-suffering mated pair, and the best reason ever created for a no-effort-spared, veil-wide festival. The long-suffering aforementioned pair were not told what was in the offing until well after the preparations were complete, and it was obvious that the thing would take place even if the two main participants had to be carried to the pledging circle, bound hand and foot and gagged. There had, in fact, been a suggestion that holding the ceremony under such conditions would be rather amusing, though Snowfire leveled a glare at the person who'd made that suggestion that was so intense he was probably still putting balm on his burns. One way or another, it was clear that Snowfire and Nightwind were not going to escape Kevala's plans for them, 
So they agreed to go through with it all, with acute embarrassment, but what Darion considered to be astounding good grace. The wedding garments alone must have taken months to complete. If the Herr Tassi enjoyed dressing up their human charges as if they were big dolls, this time they had dressed their subjects up as if they were a pair of sacred images. Take Nightwind. Part of her hair had been piled up on the top of her head and secured with beaded and bejeweled combs and skewers, while the rest was in braids entwined with more beads, tiny crystals, silver charms, and silver chains. At the moment there was only a single feather in her hair, one of Kells, set in a silver and crystal clasp. Her robes, sky-blue and embroidered with silver griffins, both realistic and representations of her badge, had a train so long it needed its own attendant to manage it, and sleeves that trailed along the ground nearly as far as the train. She probably wouldn't have been able to move if Nightbird hadn't been there to help carry and arrange the train. Around her neck were two necklaces, the first a slender silver chain that encircled her neck so that its pendant lay in the hollow of her throat was a simple one and the twin to one that Darion wore. The pendant was a hawk talon, mounted in silver and accented with a blue moonstone. The second was a huge silver pectoral collar of thin flat strands twisted and twined about each other in a way that made Darion dizzy when he'd tried to trace their roots earlier. Her badge as a silver griffin nestled into the front as if the collar had been made to accept it, which obviously it had. Her final ornament was a belt that fitted about her hips and hung to the ground in front, made of more flat silver strands which matched the pectoral collar. Nor did she outshine Snowfire. His robes, though lacking the overlong train, were otherwise similar. Also in sky blue and silver, his featured owls embroidered on them, and a silver ornamented sleeve glove that extended to his shoulder. He wore a pectoral and belt no less magnificent than Nightwind's, but differing from hers in that his featured enormous blue moonstones, cut to resemble the moon in her several phases instead of silver griffin badges. Both of them wore blue-dyed deerskin boots with silver trimmings. Not that anyone could actually see them under all that finery. To Nightwind's left stood her sister Nightbird and Kelvrin. To Snowfire's right stood Darion, and on a single enormous stand, Wheel, Her, and Kuari, side by side. Had their bond birds been smaller, both Darion and Snowfire would have been carrying them, but the weight of the eagle owls rendered that impractical. Nightbird wore a scaled-down version of her sister's robes, with no train, sleeves that reached only down to the ground instead of trailing out behind her, embroidery only on the hems of the skirt and sleeves, and an embroidered belt instead of a silver one. Her jewelry was limited to her silver griffin badge at her throat and a couple of silver hair sticks with pendants of blue moonstones. Darion, however, wore something entirely different from Snowfire's outfit, although it was in the wedding colors of silver and blue. Instead of a long, floor-length robe with hanging sleeves, he had on a blue silk shirt with a silver-embroidered placket, long sleeves gathered into silver-embroidered cuffs, and a band of silver embroidery at the hem of the shirt. Like Snowfire's robes, the embroidery on his shirt was of owls. The long shirt was held in at the waist, like a gathered tunic, with a silver belt worked with more owls. Beneath the shirt he wore absolutely plain blue silk breeches and boots similar to Snowfire's, and over the entire outfit he wore a blue, floor-length silk velvet vest.
It was the vest that had touched and pleased him and brought a lump to his throat when he first saw it, for the Herr Tassi had duplicated in silver the embroidery that his mother had done on that cherished but long outgrown leather vest she had made for him. Darion carried Snowfire's weapons, his bow and quiver, climbing stick and short sword and daggers. Nightbird carried night winds. This was supposed to show that both were warriors in their own right and expected to defend each other on an equal basis. A rather nice touch, Darion thought, especially since there were no other weapons anywhere in sight other than the occasional belt dagger. Warrior to warrior, man to woman, mage to healer, it was a good pairing. The six witnesses were arranged behind all of them in a half-circle. Consciously or unconsciously, they had each dressed in a different rainbow color and had arranged themselves in rainbow order. Purple, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. The three elders, one woman and two men, all with silver-white hair, all wore green with gold embroidery one with a motif of sun-tail hawks, one with coopery hawks, and the third with peregrine falcons. None of the elders or witnesses was closely related to either Snowfire or Nightwind. This was according to custom of long standing. The audience, as much as Darion had been able to see of it, had turned out as splendidly arrayed as the witnesses and the elders. It wasn't all humans, either, for there were plenty of hair tassi in embroidered vests and sashes, or curiously cut robes, dihili bedecked with flower wreaths and ribbons, and griffins in jeweled harnesses. There were kairi in attendance as well, but they flatly refused to bedeck themselves in anything, and amid the riot of color their gray fur left them blending with the shadows." The ceremony began with the leftmost of the three elders speaking first. Here stands before us this day Nightwind Kelesia, warrior, Trondir of the Silver Griffins, healer among the Kaledain, Elder Leaf Spear declaimed. Here stands before us Snowfire Kevala, warrior and mage, co-leader of the first expedition into Valdemar, well known to all of us. These two wish to join together in sight of our clans, to be as a living bridge between Kelesia and Kevala. If there be any here who object to this joining, give tongue that we may hear and consider what you have to say. He waited a moment, but of course there was no objection, though Kell looked around so fiercely that anyone who might have considered doing so would instantly have reconsidered the idea as a very bad one. Perhaps that was the idea behind having such firm friends stand on the platform with you. For this joining, Nightwind Kelesia pledges to remain here, far from her birth home, to bring her skills to Kevala. For this joining, Snowfire Kevala pledges to give her home, hearth, and hand, that she never feel the loss of her birth home and all she has left behind. For this joining, the elders of Kevala and Kelesia have sworn to honor these pledges in their stead, should ill luck befall either. He paused again for effect, then continued when virtually everyone nodded in agreement. The veil is more than this place and its heartstone. If the heartstone were no more, if we sought another home, where we were, would still be Kevala. There is no Kevala without the people. There is no clan without all of us. Our strength is in our bonds to one another, and to make another bond strengthens us all. To make a bond between two so near in heart, yet so different in origin, makes both our clans stronger. 
When he was done, the rightmost elder, Rain Lance, picked up as smoothly as if they were one person and not three. This bond, this joining, is not meant to be a fetter. A joining is a partnership, not two people becoming one, the second elder said, though not as sternly as Starfall had said it the first time they took their vows. Two minds cannot fuse, two souls cannot merge, two hearts cannot keep to the same time. If two are foolish enough to try this, one must overwhelm the other, and that is not love, nor is it compassion, nor responsibility. You are two who choose to walk the same path to bridge the differences between you with love. You must remember and respect those differences and learn to understand them, for they are part of what made you come to love in the first place. Love is patient. Love is willing to compromise. Love is willing to admit it is wrong. There will be hard times. You must face them as bound warriors do, side by side, not using the weapon of your knowledge to tear at each other. There will be sadness as well as joy, and you must support one another through the grief and sorrow. There will be pain, but pain shared is pain halved, as joy shared is joy doubled, and you each must sacrifice your own comfort to share the pain of the other. And yet you must do all this and manage to keep each other from wrong actions, for a joining means that you also pledge to help one another at all times. You must lead each other by example, guide, and be willing to be guided. Being joined does not mean that you accept what is truly wrong. Being joined means that you must strive, that you both remain in the light and the right. You must not pledge yourselves, thinking that you can change each other. That is rankest folly and disrespectful, for no one has the right to change another. You must not pledge yourselves, thinking that there will be no strife between you. That is fantasy, for you are two and not one, and there will inevitably come conflict that it will be up to you to resolve. You must not pledge yourselves, thinking that all will be well from this moment on. That is a dream, and dreamers must eventually wake. You must come to this joining fully ready, fully committed, and fully respectful of each other. Now the third elder, Silver Swan, took up the thread of ceremony and a silken cord of silver and blue. Nightwind extended her right hand and Snowfire his left, and the elder bound them together with the cord. Now you will no longer fear the storm, the elder said in ringing tones, for you find shelter in each other. Now the winter cannot harm you, for you warm each other with love. Now, when strength fails, you will be the wind to each other's wings. Now the darkness holds no danger, for you will be the light to each other's path. Now you will defy despair, for you will bring hope to each other's heart. Now there will be no more loneliness, for there will always be a hand reaching out to aid you when all seems darkest. Where there were two paths, there is now one. May your days together be long upon the earth, and each day blessed with joy in each other. With their hands still bound together, Snowfire carefully took a silver hair clasp he had been holding in his right hand, one with two feathers hanging from it, one of wheels and one of hers, and clasped it onto the elaborate construction that was Nightwind's hair. At the same time, she fastened a similar clasp with one of Kell's smaller feathers into his hair with her left hand. That had been a rather clever touch. Nightwind had no bond bird, of course, but everyone agreed that her bond with Kel 
certainly was of the same order. Then, the ceremony finally over, they turned to face the crowd, and as the witnesses parted so that the audience could see them clearly, raised their bound hands above their heads. The cheer that erupted literally shook leaves and blossoms out of the trees, showering them both with fragrant petals. More flowers flew at them from the audience and dropped onto their heads from the talons of bond birds, who seemed to take a great deal of pleasure out of picking a target and hitting it. Flowers were everywhere, the air so thick with them that it looked like a blizzard. Night wind and snow fire were exempt from the pelting, but Darion had to put up a hand to fend off all the blossoms intended for his head. Beneath the storm of flowers, the pair paused long enough for a rather heated kiss, a sure sign that though they'd been bonded for two years, they hadn't become bored with each other. No one could have possibly enjoyed a party in those cumbersome ceremonial outfits. However, the Taledras had long since solved that problem. The six witnesses stepped forward and removed the cord, holding the pair's hands together, cutting it into six pieces and each taking one as a physical token that the marriage had been made. Should they ever decide to dissolve the joining, the six pieces would have to be retrieved and burned in another ceremony. Once the ceremonial cord was taken off their hands, night wind and snow fire simply touched hidden clasps and stepped out of their outer ceremonial robes, leaving them in the hands of the witnesses who had been waiting to take them. They didn't have to hold the garments for long. In a moment, previously invisible Hertasi whisked them away, to be shortly displayed on stands during the celebration for the admiration of anyone who wanted to examine them. From this moment on, the robes became the heirloom works of art they truly were, and would be displayed on the walls of Snowfire's Ekele now looking far more comfortable, wearing shirts and breeches just like Darion's, they joined the throng of well-wishers. Meanwhile, more Hertasi materialized among the crowd with trays of every kind of finger food and drink imaginable. Aishan appeared at Darion's elbow to take Snowfire's weapons. The three owls flew up into the boughs so that the perch could be removed, and a group of musicians took over the ceremonial platform. Darion was amazed to see that one of the musicians was a creature that could only be a member of the Tervardi, the bird people. He'd never seen one until now, for although the Tervardi were traditional allies of the Taledras, there was no colony of them near Kevala Vale. Darion tried to stare without staring. He could not tell if the Tervardi was male or female, but if coloration followed the same pattern as in birds, and if the feathers weren't painted as some of the griffins were, then it was probably male. Its head, covered with scarlet and black feathers with a hint of a crest, had a definite beak rather than lips. The arms were feathered as well, wings, but non-functional ones, too abbreviated to be of any use, even in gliding. There was a broad feathered tail, and it wore a type of wrapped garment that left the tail free. The musical group consisted of the Tervardi, two Hertasi playing drums, and four Taledras who played harp, gittern, flute, and some sort of horn, respectively. It was soon evident, once they struck up a melody, that the Tervardi was their vocalist. It was also evident why. No human voice could duplicate the haunting sounds that emerged from the Tervardi's fluttering throat as it broke into song. Havens, Darion thought, listening with his mouth agape. No wonder they never sing for anyone but Hawk Brothers. They'd be carried off before you could say soprano. There was a thriving trade in Tervardi entertainment slaves in the distant past, until the survivors managed to gather under the protection of the veils, a voice said softly behind him. 
he turned to find himself gazing into the eyes of a second Tervardi, this one drably plumaged in black and red-brown. Well, drab compared with the first one's black and scarlet. Her markings were quite lovely, and if he hadn't already seen the male, he'd have thought her quite striking. The enormous eyes, so dark a brown as to seem black, gazed back at him with no expression that he could read. It was easy for the slavers to get what they wished from us. The female, the singer's mate, continued, her voice a softer version of the singer's, though no less melodious. After all, what male would not sing when his captors threatened to torture his mate and female chicks if he refused? She saw that I'm not born Taledras, and she's testing me. But what should I say? What song could sound sweet under those conditions, he countered, after a moment of blankness? Whoever would order such an atrocity had no heart the only songs worth hearing are those sung in happiness and freedom. He had only thought that he could not read the Tervardi. Now he realized that she had the same feather language as the bond birds. When she first spoke, her feathers had been slicked down with tension. Now she relaxed. The feathers around her beak puffed up, and her face looked rounder and softer than it had a moment ago. You speak wisely for one so young, she replied, with trilling chuckle, or a chuckling trill. What bird fly you? Kuari, fledged of her and wheel, he replied promptly, and held out his arm with a quick mind touch to Kuari himself. He braced himself for the weight as Kuari came in and ducked his head a little to avoid the impact of those huge, silently powerful wings. The only warning that Kuari was near came when the wind his wing strokes created made a second storm of all the flower petals scattered about. His arms strained as Kuari settled gently on the guard, and the great talons closed carefully about the leather. The Tervardi trilled something at Kuari, who cocked his head to listen, then replied in a series of soft hoots, like those made to nestlings. Then he closed his eyes and reached out with his beak to preen a strand of Darion's hair. The Tervardi chuckled again and relaxed further. Her facial features puffed up so that her beak nearly disappeared. She held out a four-taloned hand, three long claws, and one short and opposed, exactly like a thumb. Darion took it without fear. Relia que treva, she said. Darion Firkin que Valdemar que vala, he replied. A long name, she observed. You have not changed it in Taledra's fashion? He shrugged. I thought about it, but Taledras take new use names when they change, and I haven't changed, not really. I'm still Darion, with more knowledge and more memories, and a bit more common sense, I hope. I have more skills now, and I've got more friends, but when you come down to it, I'm still myself. I've grown, but I haven't changed. Then wear the name you are, Darion Firkin Kevaldemar Kevala, she told him firmly. Suddenly, with the lightning change of topic he was to come to associate with Tervardi, asked, And what think you of Sarsi's singing? He waved his hands helplessly at that. Unbelievable, he finally managed. Indescribable. I could listen to him all night. Well, with pauses for refreshment, that opportunity you will have, passenger, she said, clearly very pleased with his reaction. Indeed, on so romantic an occasion, we are to sing courting ballads, we too, and that, for outsiders to hear, is rare. He bowed, hoping that also would please her. 
then I hope you will allow me to thank you in place of my brother Snowfire and his mate, who will be enchanted and overwhelmed by the honor you do them. Now she laughed aloud, a silvery gurgle of sound, and spread her arm pinions. Oh, you are wasted among the mages, passenger, she crowed. Such delicate speeches mark you as an elder afore the time. She didn't give him a chance to reply to that, turning away instead and taking the platform with the other musicians. Somehow, the group of musicians managed to go from the first song straight into the next without pause to consult one another, although it was entirely possible they were using mind touch instead. The second melody must have been one of the courting songs, for first the male sang, then the female, trading melodies and replies until the two strains joined in unexpected harmonies. Darion gathered Kuari to his chest and absently scratched the owl's back and neck, much to Kuari's pleasure, while he listened with his eyes closed to be able to better concentrate on the music. This song came to a definite end with a moment of silence followed by applause and cheers. Darion opened his eyes again to see the two Tervardi bowing slightly in acknowledgment and the female looked directly at him and deliberately winked before turning her attention back to the rest. The musicians launched into a piece that was purely instrumental, and Darion gave Kuari a boost back into the air so that he could rejoin the other bond birds in the canopy. Then he wandered off, intending to find something a little more substantial than the tiny savories being handed around by the Hertasi, he hadn't eaten since he woke up. Aishan had kicked him out of bed far too early, and he'd been running errands since. He'd really felt too keyed up to eat anyway, but now that everything was safely over and nothing disastrous had occurred, he was starving. And a couple of tiny bites of sausage-stuffed pastry weren't going to take the edge off his hunger either. The most logical place to look first was the guest lodge, and going there had the added advantage that he could take off his wedding finery and put on something he wouldn't have to worry about ruining. Once he made his way to the point where the crowd thinned out a little, he made decent progress to the far side of the veil, although the temptations to stop were many. Besides the group of musicians from Ketreva Vale that included the two Tervardi, there were other musicians from Kevala scattered here and there, carefully positioned so that no group's music interfered with the music from another individual or group. Darion passed three individual musicians and two groups on his way to the guest lodges. The groups had set up in spaces big enough to allow for dancing— one group was playing a slow-paced couple's dance, and the second a faster, heavily syncopated group dance. As he had suspected, the hot pools were in use, though as it was early in the day, they were not heavily crowded. It was a bit of a surprise to see the number of people swimming, though. That isn't my idea of what you do at a wedding. Well, maybe I'm just being provincial. Wonderful aromas met his nose before he even reached the door of the guest lodges, and the tempting array of food spread out there made him waver in his resolution to change before he ate. Only the fact that his favorite foods were always the messiest to eat made him stick to it, even though the scents seemed to follow him down the corridors and into his room to taunt him. He changed quickly, retaining only the new silver belt from his wedding costume, and sprinted back down the corridors, tracking the scents with his nose in the air like a hungry hound. A short time later, blissfully nibbling on a square of pastry wrapped around a filling of finely chopped nuts and honey, he felt ready to join the rest of the veil. He strolled out into the open and started back toward the Daihili Meadow. 
Darion stopped long enough to listen to one of the solo musicians, then obtained something to drink from a passing Hertasi and went on to his destination. Arriving just in time for the Tervardi to begin singing again, he sat himself down near the platform on the soft grass and proceeded to lose himself for some undefined length of time while the music created fantasies in his mind. When he emerged from the spell that the music cast on him, he found that he had company. Beside him, with her blue eyes still filled with the dreams that Tervardi's singing sent into her mind, was Summer Dance. He had not seen her for the last few days, but that was no great surprise, as they had both been working on the wedding preparations and their errands hadn't overlapped. In addition, she was apprenticed to Steelmind, the specialist in plants who was the caretaker, among other things, of most of the garden spots in the Vale, including the herb garden. As a consequence, she hadn't had any free time over the past three or four days. He was happy to see her at last, and glad that he had changed into what had been his best outfit until he got the one for the wedding. She certainly looked spectacular, gowned in something silken that flowed over her, a waterfall of luminous fabric in several shades of green. She wore as ornaments a collar of braided gold, silver, and copper wire, with strands of crystal beads and feathers braided into her black hair. She smiled at him and nodded her head at the platform. "'What do you think?' she asked." This is the fourth time I've heard this group. They travel among the vales, and we try to get them to come once every year or so, but this is the first time they've come for a pledging. He tried to come up with enough superlatives and failed. It's the kind of singing you hear in dreams, and no, you can't reproduce when you wake up, he said finally. There's nothing like it and nothing more beautiful, except when a Tervardi flock sings in chorus, and I've only heard that once, she agreed. I had to go to Ketreva for that, but it was worth the journey. I got to see them dance besides singing. Do you dance at all in Valdemar? Every chance we get, he laughed. But if you're asking if I personally dance, I do and I learned a couple of dances from the team while I was with them, too. Is this an invitation? Well, the group is taking a break, so there isn't anything going on here for a while, she pointed out, and it's a lot more fun to dance when you have a partner. Round dances are all right for children, but couple dances and group dances are livelier and more interesting. That's the truth. He agreed as he stood up, then extended a hand to her to help her to her feet. He took the lead, since he knew where the dancing circles had been set up, and as luck would have it, the first one they came to was just starting a new set as they arrived. He soon saw how she had gotten her use name. She was quick, graceful, light on her feet, and evidently untiring. He had no intention of quitting before she was ready, and found himself panting and with a raging thirst by the time the musicians paused for a break themselves. He was half afraid that she'd suggest finding one of the other dancing circles, but she took pity on him. Laughing, she led him to the side of the circle and left him for a moment, only to return with cool drinks for both of them. He didn't know any of the people they'd been dancing with, but they all knew who he was. Not so difficult, since he was the only outsider in the clan. With his brown hair and eyes, he couldn't be mistaken for anyone else, not when the only variation on blue eyes, golden skin, and black hair among Taledras or Kaledain was the blue eyes, golden skin, and white hair of mages who'd worked with heartstone and node magic. Oh, not quite true. Some scouts, if they had white hair, dyed it in patterns spring through autumn to camouflage themselves, but none of them had plain brown hair. 
For the most part, his erstwhile dancing partners were just as winded as he was, and the Hertasi circulating among them with more of the refreshing mint-flavored drink soon found themselves empty-handed. Summer Dance was the only one who still had breath to talk. She introduced him to the other dancers, but he promptly forgot most of their names. He had just about caught his breath and cooled down when the musicians began again, and she drew him back into the circle for another round. It wasn't until after the third round was complete that she professed herself tired, and by that time his legs were getting wobbly. When she suggested a hot soak, he was only too happy to agree. But when she led him, not in the direction of the communal pools, but down a tiny, vine-shadowed path that threaded between trees away from the sounds of celebration, he started to wonder if she had something more than a soak in mind. Steady on, he told himself. She just might want some privacy rather than the mob. But things were certainly promising to be interesting. She stopped at a place where the path appeared to end, and parted a curtain of flowering vines. On the other side of the vines lay a bubbling pool, one fed, obviously, by the same hot springs that fed the communal pools. Beside the pool, on a small stone bench, was a thick pile of towels. Well, why not? It wasn't as if they were going to get rained on in the middle of a veil. Here... "'Isn't this better than jostling for a space with everyone else?' she asked, as she slipped unselfconsciously out of her dress and into the pool without making so much as a splash. He lost no time in following her example. The water was deliciously hot, and all of his tired muscles melted under its influence. "'Ah, there is no comparison with Erald's Grove, he thought blissfully, as he closed his eyes and slumped until his chin touched the surface of the pool. Here I am, entirely alone with Summer Dance. No one will care what we do or don't do. She's of age, I'm of age, that's all there is to it. Back home, if anybody found me with a girl like this, her father would be hunting me down with a pack of male relatives, and her mother would be making wedding arrangements. He took a peek out of one eye at Summer Dance. Apparently, she wasn't as inexhaustible as she'd been at pains to appear, for she was relaxing in the water with the same expression he'd been wearing. Beads of moisture collected on her forehead, and the hair around her face started to curl in the heat and damp. Where are we, exactly, he asked, having only a vague notion of how far they had gone. At the farthest end of the vale, my Ekele's up there. She pointed straight up, and he followed her pointing finger with his eyes. Squinting upward through the rising steam, past vines and foliage obscuring everything, he made out a bit of staircase against a trunk, and what might have been a piece of floor. I got tired of having to tramp forever to get a hot soak, or to have to tramp forever after I got a hot soak. When we got a reasonable amount of magic back, and I got to pick something I wanted, I picked this— "'Good choice,' he said, closing his eyes and leaning back again. "'But not before he'd managed to find a fresh blossom growing within reach. "'Now came the moment for internal debate. "'So, do I offer her a flower? "'In Taledra's terms, especially in a situation like this one, "'offering Summer Dance a flower would express without words "'not just his admiration for her, but that he wanted to share decidedly more than just her platonic company. Chaste, rather than chaste, as the saying went. It wasn't that he was debating whether he wanted to offer her a flower. He was debating the etiquette of it. This was her pool, beneath her ekele, her territory, so to speak. So did he make the first overture, or would it be polite to wait and see if she did? But what if she was waiting for him to express an interest? What if she would be disappointed and hurt 
if he didn't make the offer. Of course, all this might be innocent, simply companionable, but among the taledras, being offered a flower didn't imply acceptance, and she could always turn him down. I'm thinking too much. He reached out and picked the flower without opening his eyes, held it for a moment, then turned toward her. Ah, uh, summer dance? He opened his eyes as he spoke, only to stare at her, seeing that she had just turned and was offering him a flower at the same moment. They stared at each other for a long breath, then broke into helpless laughter, leaning into each other's arms for support. Then, when their laughter faded, they found other things to share. Sunset, normally all but imperceptible beneath the huge trees, was spectacular from summer dances Ekele, high in the boughs of a tree on the edge of the clearing, and they were both in a position to appreciate and pay attention to the sight by then. Still, neither Darion nor Summer Dance was prepared to end the celebration quite so early, so they collected themselves and their belongings and rejoined the dancing just as dusk fell. Special illuminations had been planned for after dark, effects that required magic, and Darion was happy to see that they appeared on schedule. Even though he wasn't in charge of the entertainment, he had something of a proprietary interest in it. The main event was a display of underwater lighting, with constantly changing colors beneath the cascades of one of the more elaborate waterfall arrangements. It had three levels of falling water, with each of the three levels subdivided into additional cascades, all plunging into a small but deep pool, frequently used for acrobatic play and roughhousing. No one swam there tonight. Mage lights glowed behind the falling water from within recesses in the rocks, and one in the bottom of the pool turned the foaming water into a froth of light. The clever mage who'd planned this was at hand to control the changing colors so that no sequence was ever repeated. You know, Summer Dance remarked, as they spotted night wind and snow fire among those admiring the cascades, I think it's just as well that they already got their real pledging over with while all of you were out there. She waved her hand vaguely in the direction of Valdemar. If this had been their real pledging, instead of an excuse for an enormous party, they'd have been missing all of this or else they'd feel as if they had to pretend to enjoy it when all the while they really just wanted to be alone together. As it is now, this is just a celebration that happened to involve them, but it's more like an anniversary party, so they can relax and enjoy it along with everyone else. He realized at once that she was probably right. Once night wind and snow fire had given in to popular demand, they'd really managed to be quite relaxed about the entire occasion, far more relaxed than anyone else was, in fact. Very perceptive, he exclaimed. I wouldn't have thought of that, but I think you're right. Summer Dance shrugged. I know my cousin, she pointed out. Look how utterly calm he's been since they got out of their robes, and how he's relaxed and gone along with the fun. They know their pairing is solid and is going to last. They don't feel as if they have to prove how happy they are together to an audience of well-wishers, and now that the ceremony is over, they know they don't have to be the center of everything any more. If I didn't know better... I'd say it was you who was the Trondiern in training, and not Nightbird, he teased, as the lights beneath the waterfall cascades changed slowly from blue to purple en masse. How did you figure all that out? She elbowed him. Just because I'm apprenticed to steel mind, that doesn't mean I think like a plant, she chided. How do you think he got the use name of steel mind, hmm? 
He watches everything and everyone, and doesn't say much, but when he does, it's worth listening to. He's quite good at figuring people out after all that observation. I'd like to think I've been learning that from him, too. I think you can bet on it, he told her seriously, and was rewarded with a sparkling smile. I also think you've got to be getting hungry by now. And you're observant as well, or else you heard my stomach growling. Let's see what new goodies have been put out. There's bound to be supper dishes by now. She dashed off, casting a glance behind to see if he was following, and he responded to the challenge. They raced each other down overgrown, little-used paths to the guest lodges. Summer Dance had a distinct advantage because she knew the Vale so well, but he had longer legs, so they burst out of the undergrowth, neck and neck, and found themselves part of a goodly crowd of equally hungry folk crowding into the entrance to the main hall. By now, Darion's appetite had returned with a vengeance, and the wonderful aromas nearly drove him to distraction. A real meal had been spread out this time, with hot and cold dishes to choose from instead of just snacks. Darion motioned Summerdance to go in ahead of him, feeling as if he would make a poor showing if he let hunger overcome manners. They took plates made of flat bread from a stack waiting at the side of the table and heaped them with their choices. At Summerdance's urging, Darion took portions of things he didn't recognize. They stood together for a moment, looking around to see if there was anyone here that they knew, then spotted Nightbird. She sat in the middle of a congenial group of young men and women, most of whom were strangers to him. A few of Nightbird's companions were younger than Darion was, but most were about the same age. As soon as they'd spotted her, she noticed them and waved them over. They found a couple of unused cushions and sat down with the rest of the group. Everyone, this is Darion, Nightbird said, giving his name the Taledras pronunciation. Darion, pay attention, she continued with a giggle. I'm only going to introduce people once. He paid quite careful attention to their names as Nightbird introduced her friends and fixed names properly with the faces in his memory. Meanwhile, he ate, enjoying all the new flavors. It was all quite different, except the thick slices of meat, and even that was spiced in a way he'd never tasted before. Round puffs of pastry proved to be breaded and fried slices of vegetable. A green paste that Summer Dance had greeted with enthusiasm was probably from another vegetable of some kind and made a fantastic garnish on just about everything. Little red squares were not sweet, as he'd expected, but crisp and peppery. He wished he'd taken more of the flat, round bread. It was wonderful when wrapped around the meat. He spent more time listening than talking. For one thing, it was the first time he'd seen so many of his age in one place. For another, he was interested in what they did, since no one was ever idle in a veil to his knowledge. This was where he got some surprises. He had somehow gotten the vague idea that most Hawk brothers were mages, that Snowfire and the other scouts were the exception— in a few moments, he learned that his perception was backward. "'So what's your next assignment?' Nightbird asked a group of three sitting close together in a way that suggested close friendship rather than an amatory grouping. "'You'll laugh,' said one of the two girls. "'Mushroom hunting. The morels are coming up now, and the cooks want plenty.' Nightbird didn't laugh. She shrugged. You can't always be the ones patrolling the border, she pointed out with inescapable logic, especially not with seven scout groups in training at the same time. You were just lucky on your first assignment and got the exciting one. Besides, the cooks aren't the only ones who want morels. Exactly so, agreed an older boy. 
As I can tell you from my training last year, we spend more time hunting game and finding fungi than we do in patrols, and much, much more time in boring, uneventful patrols than in actually fighting anything dangerous. He laughed. As Whitehawk says, six weeks of boredom punctuated by half a candle mark of sheer terror. I think I'll volunteer for the next Valdemar expedition. At least they saw some action. Wouldn't mushroom hunting be more in the line of Hertasi? Darion asked. Not really, the boy replied. The Hertasi have plenty of work here in the Vale, and we can hunt mushrooms and check up on the territory inside our border at the same time. Despite what they might tell you, they can't do everything. Darion discovered from the subsequent conversation that a little less than half of them, male and female both, were scouts or scouts in training, a generic job that included hunting and gathering foodstuffs found growing wild in the woods outside the Vale, as well as patrolling the boundaries of Kevala territory. Two were mages— farther along in their studies than he was, but since they had begun earlier and had certainly applied themselves better, that was only to be expected. One was a weaver and worker with textiles, which rather surprised him, as he'd gotten the impression that the Herr Tassi did most of the crafting work. But when he ventured to ask, he found out that the trades, so to speak, were practiced by as many Taledras as Herr Tassi. Isn't that dull compared with being a scout? he asked tentatively. The weaver laughed. You heard the others. Now that we've got most of the nasties cleared out and it's easy enough to discourage poachers, it's scouting that's boring. I love what I do, and my teacher is Silverbird, the weaver who made the wedding robes. How could anybody be bored learning to weave works of art like that? I even get to spend as much time in the woods outside the Vale as any scout, because I'm also working with Azure Heart, the dyer, and we're always looking for new colors. It's just as good doing metal work, added another. The Heretasi haven't got the strength to make anything large, or anything out of iron or steel. If you want a sword with a proper blade of twelve-folded steel, it has to be one of us who makes it. And who could get tired of that sort of work? The Hertasi can't blow glass either. It's too dangerous for them to get that close to the furnaces, said a girl with a profusion of scarlet and gold glass beads strung on the hair of one side of her head. The glasswork has to be done by humans. The others chimed in with similar praise for their professions, and he now learned that most of the Hawk brothers of Kevala were actually craftspeople, with only minor abilities at magic. In this little group alone, there were the weaver and smith, both in training, as well as Nightbird, who trained to care for the griffins, Summerdance, who was going to be a plant worker, and the girl glassblower, and a young man who was already a practicing Fletcher. A veil was truly a largely self-sufficient organism, certainly as self-sufficient as Erold's Grove had ever been. After they'd all finished eating, the group somehow stayed together and went off to virtually take over one of the dancing circles. At that point, Summerdance found a partner with as much energy as she and relinquished Darion's company to Nightbird. Since Nightbird had not yet heard the Tervardi sing, and Darion's lessons had not included the complicated couple dances the others were performing, he went with her back to the platform and happily sat through two more sessions of their music. Finally, though, the long day began to catch up with him, and he caught himself yawning. I'm ready for more dancing, Nightbird declared, when the music group took another break. She glanced over at him, caught him in mid-yawn, and giggled. You look more like you'd rather be asleep. Since she'd carefully said, asleep, and not in bed, he took the comment at face value and not as another invitation. He rubbed his eyes with the back of his hand and grinned sheepishly. 
Well, he temporized, I was up at the break of day and running from the time my feet hit the ground. She laughed. I'll tell you what. Partner me for one dance set, and then we'll see how you feel. He nodded agreement and helped her to her feet. They wound their way across the veil until quite by accident they came across a third dance circle and joined it. This one, populated by people of Snowfire's generation, wasn't quite as rowdy as the one that Summer Dance had gravitated to, but it was lively enough for Darion. Once again, these were dances that Darion had not learned, but they were easy enough to follow. This was a cross between a couple dance and a round dance, with each couple performing the moves of the set in turn while the others kept time clapping. The dancers put Nightbird and Darion at the end of the line, which gave him seven chances to learn the next move before he had to do it. The dances moved briskly, with some pretty acrobatic moves as the dances grew more complicated with each new tune. There was quite a lot of twirling, turning, and lifting one's partner, and Darion found himself running out of energy after a while. So did Nightbird, too, evidently. After that one set of dances, she retired from the field, declaring herself defeated by her own lagging energy. I'm for a swim, she decided after a moment. What about you? A swim seemed like a good idea, a fine way to cool off after all that dancing. Conveniently enough, the large swimming pond turned out to be just on the other side of the trees and bushes screening the dance circle. Nightbird just led him around the corner, and there it was. There were other people at the swimming area who'd had the same idea, but the place was quiet and only dimly lit with flickering lanterns with colored paper shades, and no one seemed bothered by two more joining them. Single swimmers drifted across the still surface with leisurely slow strokes, barely making a splash, or floated on their backs, feathering the water with gentle movements of only their hands. Nightbird slipped out of her gown while he was still letting his eyes adjust to the relative darkness, and she plunged into the water without a backward look. He peeled off his clothing and followed, taking sensuous enjoyment in the silken feeling of the cool water on his hot skin. He concentrated only on making as little sound and turbulence as possible to preserve the tranquil atmosphere. Darion crossed the pond a few times, then the last of his energy ran out completely. Spotting a pile of towels and robes at the side of the pond, he climbed out, dried off, and helped himself to a loose, comfortable robe from the piles beside the pool. Most of the other swimmers were gone, leaving the quiet pond, the soft light, and the sound of music drifting over from the dancing circle. Darion yawned. I don't want to go to bed yet, but I'd like to find a place to lie down and rest for a little bit without getting in anyone's way. It occurred to him that there should be several lounging places here, tents made of insect netting draped over frames with flat cushions inside, just large enough for one or two to rest in after swimming, or for child watchers to sit in while keeping an eye on little ones playing in the pond. After a moment, he found several, tucked into a curve of foliage. They were all empty, and he parted the netting and settled himself down inside one, feeling luxuriously indolent, but no longer sleepy. Or so he thought. The next thing he knew, it was quite light outside his shelter, and there were Hertasi moving about, picking up the odd plate, cup, or pair of breeches left beside the water. He felt entirely rested, so he must have slept soundly and well. So soundly that, whatever had gone on around him, it hadn't disturbed him in the least. And as he had expected, Kuari had found him. Apparently baffled by the enshrouding folds of the insect netting, the eagle owl perched on the frame of the shelter, vaguely visible through the fog of netting. He found the opening in the net and fought clear of it, shaking the frame just enough to wake Kuari. 
The bond bird opened one eye halfway, then roused all his feathers with a pleased expression when he saw that it was Darion, and he was awake. Hunt? Kuari asked eagerly, his huge golden eyes staring unblinking at Darion. Real hunt, not stupid coop birds. Poor Kuari. It has been a while since we went hunting, hasn't it? He said with sympathy that was in no small part induced by the fact that he himself felt very good. Come on, I'll get changed. You go see if you can get Kel to go along, and we'll go for a real hunt. Kuari hooted with enthusiasm and shoved off from the frame, which threatened to topple over as he left it. Darion saved it from imminent collapse, then gathered his robe around him, picked up his clothing from where he'd left it, and trotted for his quarters. When he emerged from the door of the guest lodges, clean and dressed in one of his old sets of scout clothing, with a bow and quiver in his hand and a light pack on his back, Kelvrin and Kuari were waiting for him. Kuari was fluffed up and standing on a branch with one foot tucked under his feathers, and Kelvrin posed in a beam of sunlight. The young griffin had actually grown a bit since Darion had first met him four years ago, adding muscle to his chest and legs. His head had matured as well, definitely aquiline. It no longer had that faintly unfinished look that young eagles and adolescent griffins shared. Every gleaming golden-brown feather was neatly in place from his ear tufts to the tip of his tail. His talons were freshly honed, and his bright eyes gleamed with sheer delight in living. Obviously, though others might be suffering from a little too much self-indulgence last night, Kel wasn't one of their number. "'Wind to thy wings!' Kelvrin saluted him genially, his eyes flashing with good humor and eagerness. And I hope your courting was as successful as mine. Darion laughed. Kelvrin was as much a hedonist at heart as any other griffin, and as frankly uninhibited. And if it was, he asked, then neither of us will have complaints about our homecoming. Kel replied with a wink. Kuari said we hunt. That is a good thought. Nothing much gets done the day after a celebration. Even the Herr Tassi do not do much but pick up a bit. No one cooks. Meals will be what wasn't consumed yesterday. Since I will make my own kill, I will make my own choice, and it would be good to get some fresh wild meat. That's essentially what Kuari said, and I'm all for it. Darion hefted his bow and quiver of arrows by way of confirmation. Where should we head for? North of the Vale entrance, Kel replied promptly. I heard good reports of the hunting in that direction. I packed up some of the leftovers from the feast for myself, so we don't have to come back until dark. How do we post word of where we're going? When he and Kel had gone out hunting together back in Valdemar, that had been the inflexible rule. Post where you are going and be back no later than a candle mark after dark. That way, if something happened to you, people would know that you were overdue and what direction you'd been heading when you ran into trouble. I already did, Kel assured him. With Firelands, the chief Trondirn, with Pelover, the senior griffin, and with both their Hertasi. So, since you have provisions, we can go. He was obviously itching to be on the wing, because as soon as he had finished speaking, he launched himself up into the sky, sending clouds of dust and debris in all directions. Darion was used to his impatience by now, so he sent Kuari up after him with a nudge of his thoughts, then followed both of them afoot, 
a little eager and impatient himself. Ah! Kelvrin spread his wings and legs out in the sun, flattening himself against the soft meadow grass, and started to get the glazed, half-conscious look he always wore when he was seriously sunbathing. He looked drunk, or drugged, or stunned, or... You look like a griffin rug, Darion observed, layering meat, cheese, watercress, and sliced peppers between two rounds of the flatbread he'd first tasted last night. He set out more of the honey and nut pastries on a broad leaf and propped his flask of cool spring water beside them. Kelvrin turned his head just enough to give him a disgusted look. What a vile notion, the griffin replied. Where do you get those perverted ideas? Darion took a hearty mouthful of his meal and made a point of chewing it thoughtfully before he swallowed it and responded, Mostly from the fact that you flattened yourself out until that is exactly what you look like. The only other comparisons I could make would be a lot less flattering than that one. The only thing round about you right now is your crop. Since an entire young wild pig now resided in that crop, it might well bulge. Kelvrin had not only been successful, he'd had just enough of a chase to give him some excitement, followed by a fine, clean kill. Kuari had been just as successful, snaring an unwary tree hare, and he drowsed on top of a stump in the shade of a small tree on the edge of this clearing. The meadow itself, formed when one of the enormous Pelagiris trees toppled over and took several of its brethren with it, made a fine place for everyone to rest. Darion was going to come home just as much of a mighty hunter as the others, though he had no wish to eat his catch raw. He had four fine young brush grouse, a delicacy that everyone enjoyed. He intended to present Starfall with one, Snowfire with two, and keep the fourth for himself. There was no reason at all why he couldn't roast it on a spit for dinner tonight. He knew how to cook— and maybe Summerdance might be interested in sharing his meal. She'd probably want some of the handsome feathers, too, so he'd remember to save them. He'd hung them to bleed them out. He'd field-dress them before he put them in his now-empty pack. Kel and Kuari would probably clean up after him when he did. That would be later in the afternoon. For now, they would sunbathe and enjoy their holiday, because tomorrow, Darion's education in magic would begin in earnest, and he expected to have few holidays for some time to come. He finished his meal and washed it down with spring water. Off in the distance, birds sang and a couple of crows yelled at each other. In the meadow, crickets and spring frogs vied to see who could chirp the better mating calls. Darion lay back in the soft grass and shaded his face with a fallen, leaf-covered branch he'd stuck in the earth at his head. "'So you had a lady friend last night, did you?' he asked lazily. "'Do I know her?' Kel revived from his trance, pulled in wings and legs, and brought his head up. Do I know yours? he replied. Probably. Summer dance? Kel chuckled. And your courting was successful. It wasn't a question. He sounded knowing, and Darion raised his own head to look at his friend with suspicion. And just what do you know? he demanded. Kel examined his right front foot and daintily preened a talon with the tip of his beak. Oh, just that night bird and summer dance are best friends and often near my lair. The other day they were there, and both speaking, hmm, speculatively about you— Griffins, he added wickedly as an afterthought, have very keen hearing. And what did they say? His own ears burned, but he couldn't help but be interested. 
Kel wouldn't be teasing me if it wasn't good. Kel's eyelids drooped lazily. Who am I to reveal a lady's secrets? He demanded. That would be ungentlemanly. As Darion rose, outrage at being led on and impatience warring for supremacy on his face, Kel made haste to add, I can say that they were flattering, and that Nightbird generously suggested that, since her sister might be a little too interested in the matching of herself and you, given that Snowfire is your elder brother, well, she conceded the field to Summer Dance, who has no such complications with relations. Darion subsided, his ears and neck now so hot that he really didn't want to hear anything more. We had a good time, he replied lamely. What about you? Kel chuckled again. If there was a way to embarrass a griffin on the subject of courting, Darion had yet to find it. Ah, my partner was the lovely and lissom Arkela, truly a magical creature. She is of my year in the Silvers, and told me after that she wished to make my homecoming truly memorable. He sighed and stretched out his talons, digging them into the grass in blissful happiness. Such a lady, bright of eye, swift of wing, and so skilled. We matched each other in the air, stroke for stroke, racing against the moon in courting flight. Once we were alone, out of sight of the others, she— Kel, I don't really need the details, Darion interrupted. His embarrassment redoubled, if that was possible. I'm just glad you had a good time together. Kel cast an annoyed glance at Darion, and now finally noticed how fierce his friend's blushes were. Kel's annoyance melted away under his amusement— you could say that. You could also say that the summer sun casts reasonable light and be as accurate. I tell you, Kel, he said forcefully, I believe you. You don't have to say anything more. Kelvrin's gurgling laugh did nothing to ease his embarrassment, but at least the griffin was appeased enough to drop the subject. I heard that you are expected to take your veil sometime after midsummer, he offered, after Darion's blushes finally cooled a bit. Darion seized the change of subject gladly. That's what they've told me, he confirmed. Of course, it won't really be my veil until I'm a lot older, but everyone seems to take it as written that I'll eventually be the one in charge there. They want a permanent presence in residence before the first snow falls, so I expect they'll be sending a group out there as soon as they think I'm ready. He paused for a moment, then added, Want to come along? We'll need a good team, but one that's committed to permanent residence. I would be affronted if you hadn't asked me, and I would have been forced to find a way to ensure you did, Kel exclaimed. I am all but certain that Nightwind and Snowfire intend to be part of the group. They should have one griffin, at least. Well, I was wondering if you'd want to leave here so soon, he teased. After all, when your courting is going so well— and I am hardly ready to settle and nest build, Kelvrin shot back. I have no intention of choosing a mate until as many ladies as possible are contending for the honor. 
Besides, the new vale at Erold's Grove is not so far from here that a lady could not fly in for a visit, or a gentleman return the favor. Point taken, Darion conceded. He rubbed at an insect bite and wished that the time for departure had actually been set. Then he'd know how much time he had here and could make some plans of his own. I wonder if this new teacher that Starfall wants for me is expected to come with us? For that matter, I wonder if Starfall's been able to get him to agree to be my teacher. I haven't heard a word so far. Hmm, I have. There was no mistaking that tone in Kelvrin's voice. He was quite ready to tease Darion all over again. He would have to be coaxed for every revelation. So, what have you heard? Darion decided to play along. Kel loved to tease and be teased in return. I have heard that the teacher in question was reluctant at first, but agreed. Kel considered a talon with a thoughtful expression that was entirely feigned. Why was he reluctant? Darion did want to know that much. Was it because he was essentially an outsider to the Taledras? Because he wished a holiday from students. So I heard. Still, Starfall convinced him. Kel stretched his neck out and laid his head down in the grass. I gather that Starfall has some connection with him, relatives, perhaps, enough to be of influence. Have you heard anything else about this teacher? Like his name? Darion added silently. It would be nice to know his name and clan. That he is held in high regard. I think his clan is Ketreva. Kel rumbled something indecipherable in pure contentment. How about his name, O Griffin, whose hearing is so keen? Darion countered. Surely you managed to overhear that. Rrr. Kel lifted his head and looked at Darion sheepishly. I did, but must confess I cannot remember it. You forgot his name? Oh, come on, Featherhead, you can do better than that, Darion cried. You can't be that forgetful. Well, it was in the middle of the celebration, and I had other interests, Kel protested weakly, flattening his ear tufts in chagrin. Oh, so you let a pair of bright eyes and a flirty tail drive everything important to your best friend right out of your memory? Darion countered in mock disgust. What kind of friend are you, anyway? Absolutely, and without apology. I do have my priorities, but I did not forget everything important, Kel protested, flattening his ear tufts down so far they became invisible. Only the most important part, Darion threw up his hands. Remind me never to ask you to tell a joke. You'll probably forget the point of it. You would not understand sophisticated humor, Kel grumbled back. Darion sighed. That was certainly just his luck. And it wasn't Kel's fault, after all. It wouldn't be all that long before Starfall would tell him the all-important name of his new teacher. And Kel did remember that the reason the teacher had been reluctant had nothing to do with Darion. Hey, it's all right, he said, his tone softening. You can't remember everything, not when there are a hundred people talking in your ear and a full-blown party going on. At least now I know that this teacher is going to be here and that Starfall isn't going to have to find a second choice. That's the really important part. Kell's head rose, and so did his ear tufts. 
Well, now that this teacher comes, what do you plan to do? It is clear that the elders of Kevala intend you to be their spokesman to Valdemar hereabouts, or they would not be training you to be elder to a veil. So it really will be your veil, and you would be wise to make long-term plans for it, and yourself. I know. Starfall has made that pretty clear. He laughed. And I've been thinking about it off and on for a while, not to mention every night before I go to sleep. If you don't mind listening, I can tell you what I've figured out so far. Kel's ear tufts were jauntily high again, and he nodded. Darion took a deep breath and began. First of all, we should have enough people that we can defend the place until help comes if we have to, but not so many that it's anywhere near the size of Kevala. He brushed a beetle away and continued. This isn't going to be so much a veil as an embassy as I see it. So I don't think we should have many more people than our original team. Except, of course, if you do decide to nest with some charming thing, and she's agreeable to joining us. Already he spoke of us, as if he had his little outpost built and settled. He'd have laughed at himself, except that after all his thinking and planning, it really seemed as if it existed. Anyway, he continued, we don't want to have so many people that Lord Breon thinks of us as a possible threat, or that we Taledras have designs on his holding and estate. He'd spent a lot of time thinking this over, and felt that Kel would understand why that was so important. Breon could become a real stumbling block if he wasn't treated correctly and with respect. There's another thing. We don't want to make ourselves into Lord Breon's social rival, either. Do you mean setting up a kind of court of our own? Kel asked, cocking his head to the side. I can see where that could put his nose out of joint, so to speak. Exactly. We want to keep him on our side completely, because he's the nearest highborn. He was glad that Kel saw what he was getting at so quickly. I know about touchy highborns, Kel chuckled. With the Black Kings, our near neighbors and allies, we have ample opportunity to stumble unwittingly into offense. I'd also like to establish a real healer's enclave at our Vale, he continued. That would take some pressure off Lord Breon's healer and earn the gratitude of the local Valdemarans without doing anything to compete with Lord Breon. The presence of healers, well, that basically shows people were peaceful and intend to stay that way. Had you any thought to training mages there? Kel asked curiously. Other than our own people? He shook his head. I don't think that's a good idea. Harold Elspeth and Adept Darkwind have built a mage collegium at Haven, where they can keep a careful eye on those with mage gift who aren't also heralds. They did that for a reason, Kel. I'm not sure that Valdemar trusts mages even now, and to have someone teaching mages in Valdemar without the sanction and the oversight of the heralds could be trouble. Rrr. Best we not offend there, either. I see what you mean. The griffin roused all his feathers and shook. So, aside from not offending anyone, what plans have you? I want to make our veil into the place where people come to resolve their differences, he said, his eyes alight and his voice alive with enthusiasm all kinds of people. I want it to become a place where everyone knows they'll be safe to work things out without any outside influences. I want it to be the place where Hawk Brothers come when they need to work things out with Valdemarans, or where Lord Breon brings people who aren't comfortable being in his manor. We could do really good things, Kel. I agree. Kel's enthusiasm rose right along with his. Rrr. 
would I be the only griffin in this vale, unless I should find a lady, of course? Well, you'd certainly be the one with the most experience and seniority, Darion temporized. I wouldn't bring in anyone who wasn't junior to you. That would increase my status considerably. Kell's beak gaped with delight. Darion had suspected he'd get that sort of reaction. I'd like you to be the chief griffin of the silvers there, Darion told him fondly. Frankly, I don't see why it shouldn't happen that way. I suspect that the others may not realize what kind of an opportunity we will have until it is too late. As it should be, Kell chuckled. After all, they have had their chances, and they should let others take risks of their own. In other words, if they're so fond of the comfort of the veil that they can't see opportunity hiding behind a little temporary hardship, then they don't deserve that opportunity. Darion laughed, and Kell burbled with delight. Let's talk about this on the way home, he added, getting to his feet. It won't take me a moment to clean these birds. Another good plan, Kell agreed. We must see just how many more we can make.